Okay, Kathleen's coming in. Priscilla said that she could not be with us, I think, or she's going to be here as soon as she can. Oh, good. It's recording. So that's good. Everybody can kind of take a refresher back into it. Hey, everybody. Yes. We are um, while we're... While we're waiting, I would love if anybody has any questions or concerns or like thoughts like on their uh, what they've been processing uh, from last Tuesday or any experiences. Hey, just kind of like an open forum if anybody wants to share. That would be great. Jessalyn will be here in a few minutes. Well, we don't have to. We can just sit here stare at the screen because you're such a clear and concise teacher oh my goodness especially towards once we start to get like towards 8 30 you can see everybody's just like oh my god there's so much boob right that's <laughs> we can't which I need to get my i need to get my boob so i have a, an anecdote to share Cruise. i love anecdotes cruise this afternoon um i have a sticker on my doula notebook that says breast breast milk is magic nice so he he's like what? breast milk is magic and i was like yeah it's magic he's like oh yeah you get shot oh put some breast milk on it oh a guy gets in like he's like so dramatic he's like oh you get stabbed in the you're in it you get stabbed in the chest oh what do you do put some <laughs> breast milk on it he was just like so awesome. over the top and I was like you know what yeah yeah put a yeah. little bit of milk on it yeah that sounds good to me <laughs> breast milk is a cure to pretty much anything that we can think of most everything uh, depends on how deep the, the gunshot <laughs> is it depends on what right? you're involved. <laughs> like you know but yeah in my in my ridiculous day that I had with him you know a little breast milk love and humor was was just the right, right thing I was like oh good always yes it's a great way to start the day my <laughs> kids used to sing about milk they would make up songs milk I haven't recorded and then my daughter would be like the backup it, it's it's a, it's a it's a magical thing I do I have a video it's one of those things I'm sorry that came up on one of my memories about them sitting there about singing milk. about about milk milk I love milk and then my youngest would be like milk <laughs> mama makes milk <laughs> superpowers <laughs> I, I try to want to see that I know I just say I should try to get the video and put it in one of my lectures and force y'all to I swear <laughs> like when people are like coming in and whatnot and just play it yep Okay, so nope. we've got, I've got a full screen that there will be more folks joining and uh, joining us. My lips stopped working, um, but I think we're good to get started whenever you are. So awesome. Go ahead. So we just do an intro because I'm taping everything. Okay. Uh, so, you want me to do an introduction? Is that what you said? I'm going to do one and you do one again. Okay. And so okay. I'm just going to say I'm from Sarah Morgan, Executive Director of Open Better Birth Foundation, Ship Birth Circle Community Doula Program. And I want to welcome you to our Tuesday night meetings. This is our part two meetings talking about uh, breastfeeding, lactation, chest feeding, all those important things with the amazing Laura Cox. And I'm going to turn it over to her right now. Hey, everybody. Uh, so, yep, I'm Laura Cox. I am a certified lactation educator and counselor and have been now for almost 10 years, which is super weird to say out loud. Uh, I'm also a registered nurse and in my first year of master or grad school with UCSF working on a master's in health policy. Uh, I'm here to speak to you about the lowdown on the letdown. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And... I am trying to remember, oh, I need to enable media. Trying to remember where we left off last. Can anybody give me an idea where, what the last thing we spoke about was? 
Sorry if this is making you nauseous. We went through all of that for sure. Yep. I remember we went through the stages and we talked yeah. about milk ejection reflex. We talked about um, prolactin receptor sites, right? And how they're responsible. They're on the outside of the alveoli. Mm -hmm. um, and here's our little picture here on the left. Hopefully you can see my mouse. This picture down on the bottom middle picture. Mm -hmm. You'll see those full sacs of milk and those proteins called prolactin receptor sites form on the outside of those alveoli so that when prolactin hit, floods the system, it hits those sites to stimulate uh, milk from these cuboidal epithelial cells, right? I think, I want to say um, that's kind of where we left off because I don't remember really talking about stomach capacity. At all. Yes. I Excellent. Okay, good. Okay, so we're we're in collective agreement that we have not spoken about stomach capacity. Not at all. Okay, excellent. So I kind of just rambled off all the stuff that we went through already. Um, does anybody now that we're kind of getting our heads back in the boob game have any questions or concerns or like clarifying questions or thoughts before we move forward? Anything that was like pivotal, like, oh, this made so much sense, or I didn't really care for that so much, or whatever. Can I ask a clarifying question, Laura? I absolutely love your clarifying questions. Um, They're my most favorite questions of all. In the beginning of last class, you were talking about a little bit about like the microbiome and like the unique aspects of the sugars in, in human milk. But mm -hmm. I guess my question is, even though if you were maybe were to look at like nutritional facts at the most basic level, like yes, formula can like put this much protein and this much fat and this much calories. It sounded like what you were saying was the difference is the quality of those calories and those different, like the quality of the protein. And I don't mean quality like good or bad. I mean like the specific molecular structures of these sugars, of these proteins, of these carbohydrates. And so I guess what the question is when someone comes to you, or a student or someone making a PSA that formula has this quote unquote same nutrition as breast milk, that's the defining difference, right? Like you can quantify like this many calories, this many sugars, but it's what types of those calories and those sugars and carbohydrates that actually makes the difference. Is that Yes. Uh, yeah. Different? We're talking again, just to kind of reemphasize in my brain, we're talking about the basic most molecular level, right? We're talking about in comparison of a nutritional value, what is the difference? And so then, yeah, that is the core issue that the proteins are, uh, are human specific. Um, the proteins that they are getting are either from a bovine uh, derivative or uh, a plant-based derivative or something even more specified for those that are in need of that specific requirement, right? That, that's what you're going to find for prescriptions for babies that maybe have galactosemia, right? That uh, cannot process galactose, right? So then that's when things shift and change. But um, in terms of human made human proteins for human babies is that and those specific sugars are are far more complex than what you're going to find in a formula like oligosaccharides are going to be a lot more complex and they have a lot more different functions in terms of teaching that immune system how to function as opposed to sugar for nutritional value and then we go on top of that the bacteria right we have 600 different types of bacteria within breast milk and all of them have different functions and a lot of them are again, like you said, lining that, um, creating that uh, that microbe, that uh, biome, right? That microbiome that we're all talking about, and that we're all, all now just learning about how they play a role in terms of our acute, our IQs, our our body weights, our um, all of those other things that come into play. And so, breast milk or mature milk or human milk is really that first foundational layer that lays up all of that so that when even as you get older your system is so much more set up to succeed that you're far less at risk to get the things that we're normally getting now uh, hypertension um, Alzheimer's is what they're beginning to find like um, and I'm sure Jocelyn you can you can Jocelyn you can absolutely less name way more than what I can name but that's our that's our beginning understanding of what um, 
milk itself, both colostrum and mature milk can do. Thank you. Because I, 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 do see, I do see those false arguments out there and it infuriates me to no end. <laughs> <laughs> it does. And like, I try very hard when I see those arguments, I try super hard to try to have maybe a bigger, a broader understanding of why we're doing this. Because as you can see, and as we get further into the lecture, that those people that weren't able to breastfeed or chest feed, those people that have had been cheated out of this opportunity, right, that weren't able to create those prolactin receptor sites, were not able to, to uh, breast or chest feed their infants. Um, there's that, um, that feeling of guilt and sometimes that guilt or, or shame within themselves or a sense of failure that can be projected onto the people that do, right? That, oh, well, there is no difference because my baby was formula fed and they're perfectly fine, right? Or I was formula fed and I'm perfectly fine. And, and no one's saying that you're not fine. And if you were cheated out of this experience, um, that sucks. And that's why I teach these classes so that we can stop doing that. But it is absolutely not equivocal. The two of them are not the same. Point blank, full stop. Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> well, I think my phone was listening to our class because it showed me a news story yesterday from genetic engineering and biotech news saying that um, something like, it's from Stanford University, but basically saying that something like <clears throat> absurd number like I don't want to say 90 percent but the, the vast majority of infants are becoming deficient in the gut bacterium that helps them to process those essential proteins and sugars um, and that that was coming out of um, Stanford and uh, some other schools and the doctors were basically like this is completely under the radar in pediatrics and nutrition like no one's talking about it except for people such as yourself um, so yeah, thanks to my phone for spying on us, but I always like those things, right? It's sometimes I even just say out loud just for fun, just like, I would like to have a $3 million diamond. <laughs> And then like, you get to see all these beautiful pictures of, of it's, it's fun, you know, little, little, you know, or I want to live in a million dollar house in Vermont, right? And then you get all of these ads for things that you can buy in Vermont. Wow. It's a lot of fun. A million dollars uh, in Vermont is, would be a monster property. That's what I'm thinking, right? You can have acres and you have all the trees and you have all the syrup. They, they have the syrup them. out there. Oh, yeah, let's do it. I'll hang out with Bernie, me and Bernie, grab a beer. Totally. <laughs> right? I would love to have a beer with Bernie, actually. Right? Okay. Yeah. I'll let you know. Please. Um, also, I wanted to say before I got off on that, million dollar property in Vermont. Um, <laughs> there's so much energy now around the importance of our microbiome and with COVID. Yeah. yeah. And so how yeah, it, beings are set up to not be able to handle the crap that happens on this planet, which is new viruses. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think I probably posted two or three different articles talking about how breast milk is or mature milk is and, and how it can be beneficial for things like this and that we can learn from them, right? And, and I feel like that's when, that's why I talk a little bit about or at the beginning of my lectures, I try to focus a little bit about our um, Dr. Regina Benjamin and the work that she did as a surgeon general, because it was those kinds of questions, right, that really set up a lot of information like, oh, man, maybe we don't know, you know, maybe there is a far better, bigger difference than we actually assumed it was from the beginning, right, and, and um, it's people like that that continue to push the envelope and trying to discover um, how we can address these with things that we already have, you know the things that we're already doing. You know, we have to take a look at how big a role Madison Avenue plays in what we believe and what is taught and what we know about our bodies, especially since like what the, since after World War II even, you know, with them, yeah. you know, cigarettes are good for you. Yeah, breast yeah, breast isn't that interesting? Yeah. yeah, breast milk is bad for you. Yeah. That started yeah. then, right? That started yeah. then. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it really interesting. It, it is really interesting. And it almost makes it to where like we should have multiple like these classes that I teach should have all these, especially the, the cultural um, aspect of lactation, right? Like when we talk about formula and we talk about even cigarettes and how, who are they pro predominantly advertised to and why, right? I mean, and that's a big, huge, and who are the, who are the people that are predominantly you know, in the lactation field are people that look like me, right? And that are not paving waves, ways in which we could have a more, more diverse, um, it, I could go on and on yes. and on. Yeah, yes. yeah, I know I could go on. Uh, yes. um, okay, well, that was a great question. Does anybody have, anybody else have any other questions or concerns or comments or anything that they would like to add before we move forward? Uh, Laura, I just, um want to double check the the slide that I'm seeing the newborn stomach looks kind of um, blurry I'm not able to read okay the smaller print on it and so I don't know if it's just the slide <clears throat> um, but I just wanted to bring it's, that to your attention on, oh, on, oh oh like on, on the, the on the computer print. it's only the small print that is not very legible okay is it, are you talking about the slide that you're seeing on your face right now? Or are yes. you talking about the slide? Okay, but you have you looked at the stu the the slides that I sent to you in the Google Drive, and hopefully yeah, you'll, in you'll the, be able in to the see. yeah in the drive they're clear. And last week they were fairly okay. clear. Okay. Um, I right think now, it's just like, this side. This one is pretty old and junky. Yeah. Okay. That's okay. really good to know. Maybe I'll um, redo it so that you can see it and I'll definitely read it out so yeah. you can, so you, so I can say it and you can hear it. So even your, your cursor looks kind of blurred. It's just very weird. Yeah. I don't know. It might just be is, me. <laughs> is everybody experiencing this similar thing? Is it yes. like Okay. Hmm. I wonder if I should stop share. I'm using my hotspot like I did before. So I should be connected just fine. Maybe I can stop share and then try and well, share again. If we have it in the uh, in the drive, then you can just kind of read to us what it is. Okay, good. We can. Okay. Okay, I'll do that. Okay. Uh, anything else? Okay, so prolactin receptor site theory, again, going back to the more prolactin receptor sites we have, the more longevity of, of milk supply that that person will have. Uh, so again, recharging that system. Remember going back to that we have our devices and they're all in the same room and they're all at 1% charge, <clears throat> but we only have one plug that will take so much longer for us to charge our devices. But if we have all our devices in the same room and they're all at 1% charge and each mm -hmm. one of us have our own plugs, then they will charge much faster collectively. And that is the same idea here, right? That prolactin is the energy and the devices are our Epi, uh, or, uh, you know, our cuboidal epithelial cells within those alveoli and the prolactin is that, and, uh, I'm sorry, and the cord is the prolactin receptor site. So we need our cord to connect everything together in order for everything to charge up. So hopefully that makes sense. So with that then, uh, remember that we talked about in lactogenesis one, right, that we have progesterone and prolactin. And whenever progesterone's around, it's always going to inhibit prolactin, right? It's always going to keep it down. It's the man, always going to keep them down. And because of that, though, we have this relationship that creates colostrum, right? And if we look and we see what a newborn stomach capacity is at day one and day three and one week, hopefully you can still see my, my pointer, that they also happen to coincide with the phases of lactation. Within the day one, I have colostrum, so I'm really not going to produce a lot, right? Which requires for shorter duration of feeding time, but way more frequent feedings. And why am I gonna have more frequent feedings? And why do I have a small amount of milk? Well, this is the reason why. The stomach size of this infant is pretty small. Now. Is everybody's stomach size at newborn the same size? No. Do people have different st sizes of stomachs when they're born? Sure. But generally speaking, 
we're going to look about five to seven milliliters is what a newborn one day old infant can take. That's what this says. It's day one at five to seven milliliters, and which is equivalent to one to 14 teaspoons. This is called a calamante lime. I know I'm not saying that correctly, and I apologize. Calamante. Calamante. See, Calamanti. I never say calamante, but it's Filipino, correct? This is a Filipino lime. It is Filipino, yeah. And it's calamansi with like an S sound. Calamansi. Yeah. Calamansi. Yes, perfect. Hot damn. Okay, I'll, I will continue. I think the thing is, I always want to acknowledge that this is a Filipino lime, and I know I don't say it with the correct pronunciation on all the words, but it's good to know what it is and where it comes from. Much like everybody else, right? I want to know where you come from. Anyway, moving on. So this is a calamansi lime, and which is about also maybe, if, and if somebody's ever had one, they can share, but it's about the size of a, a, a large marble, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, I agree. Nice. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. So again, we're going to have that small stomach size at day at one. Day three, that's going to increase, right? And here we have, um, I can't even read what this is, but it's equivalent to a walnut. I think it's an olive, but it's, it's, it's spelt differently and I can't read it either. So it's about the size of a walnut and it's 22 to 27 milliliters or which is also equivalent to 0.75 or one ounce, okay? And then you see these bottles here at the bottom. These are about the bottles that you're gonna find in a NICU or in a nursery or even on postpartum wards, right? They're just your typical bottles. They're, I think they're probably also the same size as those already ready mixed formula bottles that you'll find for newborns in the grocery store. So day three, we have the size of a walnut. And at one week, this is a nectarine, I believe. And it's also about 45 to 60 milliliters or about one and a half to two ounces of content or of, of fluid. So also looking back on our lactation phases, right? Between lactogenesis one and lactogenesis two is between zero to two or zero to five days, right? And so as our milk increases in volume, because we already have milk at day one, our milk is going to increase in volume. And at the same time, the stomach's capacity of this infant will also increase. Okay, so at day one, an infant should not be given 60 milliliters of anything. And what would happen if I did give 60 milliliters of anything to an infant at day one? What do you think that would do? How do you think the infant would feel or what do you think that would do to that stomach capacity? Discomfort. Sorry, go ahead, Jesse. I think he said, Jesse, you said it would grow, right? I think that's what you said. Sorry, I said throw up. Throw up, absolutely. I, right? I would probably, yeah. I, I think that this is probably, if I were to give 60 milliliters to a day one infant, it would be probably equivocal to like two Thanksgiving dinners, right? And if I had two Thanksgiving dinners, I would do other people just shout it out, right? You'd have discomfort. You may have, you, you're definitely going to be sleepy. I'm always sleepy, right? You're going to be sleepy. You're going to be barfy. Uh, you're going to be gassy. You're going to have all of those things happen to you. And so when we talk about the hospital experience for those that are lactating or, or wanting to lactate, one of the big takeaways is, is that we don't want to put a bunch of, of, of anything in that infant's stomach, right? Because if we do that, if that infant is sleepy, do you think that that infant's gonna wanna nurse an hour later after drinking two ounces of anything? Yep. No. Do you think that infant's gonna wanna nurse in two hours or three hours for that matter? I would be surprised if I saw an infant start to show hunger cue signs at you know two and a half, three, three hours. And even if they did, they would be sleepy, they would be lethargic. And, and in that process, if you're sleepy and you're kind of full and you're kind of nursing, you're not putting in a lot of effort in that latch. And with no effort in that latch, that can lead to trauma to that nipple, 
and pain to the lactating person. So you see how once we start, much like labor and birth, once we start doing those little interventions, we have this cascade of effect, uh, effects that happen and in return can really cause significant damage. Because if I have an infant that's reluctant to nurse and nipples that are traumatized and a person that's in pain, that's the trifecta of somebody that doesn't want to keep nursing every two hours. And if I don't have anybody that's nursing every two hours and I'm not getting the accumulation of prolactin receptor sites that I need to happen between zero to two or zero to five days of, of life. And if I don't do that, then at three months, that's when I get a phone call or an email from a doula that says, yo, this person is just emailing me saying that something happened to their milk supply and they don't know and they don't understand why. Right. Okay. And all of those things are really just set up in this cascade to where nobody is really aware and you're not learning this prenatally so that when you aren't able to have that milk supply that your three month old or that your six month old needs, again, you are not going to look back and say, it was that nurse, that nurse did not teach me about prolactin receptor sites, right? Mm -hmm. Or I didn't learn about this in prenatal care. They're not going to do that. They are going to say, I failed. I was not able to do something that is natural, quote unquote natural, something that is quote unquote easy, right? And I have not been able to do that. And now I have these feelings of maybe of, you know, shame or guilt, low self-esteem, uh, and maybe even viewing how you, how you're maneuvering parenting, right? So, you know, I'm not making the right decisions. I can't provide for my child, right? All of those things. And you're just now beginning on this parenting journey, right? And to have that experience can be um, unpleasant, you know, for many. Okay. So does everybody understand why stomach capacity is important, how stomach capacity relates to the phases of lactation and what cascade of events that can happen if, if this process is tinkered with in terms of any kind of supplementation within the first zero to two to zero to five days. Does it, I hope that like, cause those are my big main points. Does everybody understand how that works or have any questions or concerns? I have a question for you. Yes, I love questions. <laughs> A huge, uh, I think something that I see often, and you kind of touched on it earlier. Well, there was a bullet point maybe about it, um, and you might touch on it more later, is that uh, where I see this interruption oftentimes is with, um, sorry, right, with um, jaundice. Yeah. So a lot of pings here. Um, so <laughs> like, so, um, you know, baby born, they say you're still in the hospital. They say there's, you know, there's jaundice. So you, so you have to supplement now. Yeah. And yeah. that's just the option that's given supplement yeah. and then like pump on the side, oh, but then you bring baby to best and baby, baby is tired and not yeah. nursing. And then you're like, why isn't baby nursing? I guess I'll just keep supplementing. Right. Like, yeah. Is yeah. there, and yeah, what can we ahead. do with there? I love that question. That's such a great question. See, the and, and I'll talk a little bit more about jaundice. So I'm kind of do a broad stroke right now, but we're going to get to it later on tonight. But if the, the, the big takeaway here is any kind of supplementation, even if we were to take jaundice out and we were to apply fatigue, or if we were to apply surgery, or we were to apply uh, multiples, or we were to apply anything else within that variable, right? We take any of those things and apply and use them as an excuse to supplement without giving people the full understanding of the risks that are implied through supplementation, especially within the first zero to five days, right? We are setting everybody up here, we're, not everybody, we're setting up that dyad up for failure is what's happening. So um, with jaundice, jaundice is tricky. And I'm going to give you like a broad answer now, and we'll go into why, why it's tricky, but jaundice is tricky because jaundice can lead to what's called kernicterus. And kernicterus is a, um, is a uh, it's um it's a 100 de debilitating situation where it renders this infant uh, to grow up without the ability to speak without the ability to eat without the ability to walk or t or anything else of the sort and it, it, it because what ends up happening is the red dead red blood cells end up staining the brain and those synapses weren't able to form and so then they have 100 disability um that is 100 preventable and so 
hospitals are absolutely proactive about as soon as a bilirubin level, which is the what they call the level of red blood, dead red blood cells in this in this in the blood. As soon as those hit a certain parameter, and, and hospital policies kind of vary. I think Sutter's limit is different than Kaiser's limit, but it's around the same, right? It's a point or two, mm -hmm. give or take. Um, as soon as those hit, hospitals are pulling all the all the stops, right? And part of the issue with jaundice and what can also lead to breastfeeding jaundice is. Um, the, the thing is, is that, like I said before, when we're talking about colostrum, colostrum starts that peristalsis, right? Starts your mandible moving, the saliva going in your jaws, moving down the esophagus into the stomach through the small intestines or through the, yeah, through the small intestines, through the large intestines and out the colon, right? And everything that is sucked out from those intestines goes to the kidneys and the liver and they do all that processing right and everything ends up in the poop or the pee right and so we need to keep getting that liver to function to process those dead red blood cells but it can it, in most cases it needs it, you need to eat you have to get that to keep going and so the fear especially back in the day was that this person isn't producing enough milk right and unfortunately with colostrum they're right right? We're not producing a lot yet because we don't need to. But hospitals kind of don't care because if that baby gets cornicterous, right, you are not going to say, well, I wasn't really actually producing enough colostrum in order for us to get through jaundice. They are going to sue the hospital because this again was 100% preventable. And I'll go more into about that, but jaundice is a little bit more of a touchy subject because people feel that they have a little bit more legitimacy in terms of throwing their weight around, especially if you're a person of color or a black or African-American community member, right? So let's just put that in, in the mix as well. But we'll go more into that. But again, you're right, anytime we supplement, and when people aren't aware of the importance of colostrum more specifically, I mean, of course, all of those important things that I mentioned before, but more specifically that you're going to have smaller amounts, which equals more frequent feedings. I'm going to have shorter durations because I have a smaller stomach size. I'm going to have more frequent feedings. If people don't understand this concept, then you're going to have people that are like, baby's always on breast. They're always sucking. That means they're not getting enough, right? If I stick anything in a one in a 24 hour infant's mouth, they're going to suck. That's why we have pacifiers. They suck. The reason why they suck again is because they have to go poopy and they know that they have to establish prolactin receptor sites. They know that because babies aren't dumb. They know this because this is how they survive. This is how we as a species have survived, right? And this is why formula is a tool when we can't do this, but they know this. And so when you stick your finger in their mouth, when you stick a pacifier in their mouth, when you stick a bottle in their mouth, they're going to suck it. Sucking does not equate hunger. I think that's one of the most important things you could share with a client because mamas are flipped out thinking an understandable so. Oh, my baby's hungry. I'm not make, I'm, I must not be making enough milk because the baby wants to nurse all the time. And, you know, to, to be cheerful and be like, no, your baby's just hella smart. Yeah, that's your right. Baby and it's just helping you make more milk and, and it's good. You know, the baby's not, you know, the baby's been in your body for nine months, been fed 24 hours a day. And, you know, this is not about hunger per se. This is about, uh, and there's all kinds of wonderful things going on in the brain too, that the baby needs from sucking on its, on its parents' breast. So that's right. You know, there's all these reasons for it that it's good for little humans to suck that has nothing to do with hunger. No, and that does not mean that we shouldn't be looking for poops and peas, that we shouldn't be looking for a cessation, that we, we want to make sure that everything's working, but you know, usually it works. And when it doesn't work, it makes me wonder who has tinkered with that cascade, right? right? Or what are things that we weren't aware of and how can we better support and navigate the situation? We should always be looking to see um, if this baby is getting enough, but it shouldn't be just because we're making colostrum. Okay. Does anybody else have any other questions or concerns? I'm not seeing chat. So uh, hopefully somebody's um, looking at chat to see if there's any questions there because I can't see that. Am I? I asked and in the chat, Laura, is this is this like a capacity over a given day, or does a baby actually like get full at various feedings throughout the day? Uh, say that to me again. Can you read that to me again? 
I mean, I'm not encouraging anyone to like measure milk output, but is this the capacity in a given day or does a baby actually get full at various feedings? Okay. Yeah. So with the five to seven milliliters or one to, um, I think that's 1.4 teaspoons. I don't think that's 14. Um, it, this is for one feeding. So I would expect a baby to intake at one feeding at 24 hours old. I would expect them to take about five to seven milliliters. Oh. Can you so this me? is po 0.5 to 0.7 milliliters. Okay, no, it's five to seven milliliters. Have you seen jam in Pakistan, Omar? Oh, I can't mute you everybody. Jam, you, you drink jam? Yeah. Jam is the, the condole, the one you put in the... Uh, Folks, turn off you, your, if you're no, not talking to Laura I'm right good. now, turn off your... Who said it's alcohol? You can do it, Samsara, because sometimes people can't oh, on their well, own. there you go. I oh, I think they did it. I think they, yeah. So you have the control as the host to mute everybody. <laughs> what power? What can I, I would love to do that in my house, but. Uh, uh, no. So yeah, I, I would expect that to see in at one feeding, I would expect an infant to have this amount. I, in one feeding, I would expect an infant to have the day three amount and one feeding I would expect to have at this amount. That's what I would expect roughly in each feeding. And so you of course will have this amount in one breast or chest, or you will make more or less depending on you because you are an individual person and diversity is the spice of life, right? We're not all the same. Um, so hopefully that question was answered. Sweet. Any, any, anybody else have any other questions or concerns? So this is just again to kind of reemphasize the exact thing that we were just talking about. Increase in breast stimulation can cause increase in prolactin receptor sites. More sites equal longer breastfeeding. The amount baby sucks between zero to five days affects milk supply at three months. There is no such thing as baby pacifying. Um, at zero to three days old, baby continues nursing to create prolactin receptor sites and increases the supply for longevity. So I don't normally read my slides. I hate it when people read slides to me. It makes me very upset. So I don't normally do that, but I do that in this case because um, it's a big takeaway. And I also want to explain what I mean by baby pacifying. So you've met, you've maybe heard me mention this a couple of times in the two days that we've been together, where I call it snursing, right? Where a baby is snoozing and nursing at the same time, meaning they're not actively drinking. You don't see them with their eyes open and their, their chin dropping down. You don't hear the swallow. You don't hear them actively drinking, but they're kind of, you know, their mouth maybe moving on the nipple and they're they're kind of going in and out of sleep that's what other people refer to as baby pacifying and they tell you not they but there's a lot of people more specifically family members that'll say don't let baby do that because then there's some reason like um I, I can only assume that it's some reason like well then they'll get dependent on you or they'll <laughs> um or they'll want to keep doing it or something like this. And in my mind, I remember first hearing this. And I'm like, so I don't do this so that my 16 year old doesn't pacify on my boobs. Right. And that doesn't really make a lot of sense either. Um, you want baby to be dependent on you because I mean, maybe you don't and that's okay. Um, but I feel like that's a really weird space to be in because you should be able to nurse your baby. Um, you should, you should, you can nurse them to sleep. Uh, I don't nurse my eight-year-old and my 10-year-old to sleep anymore. Um, I used to nurse them to sleep and they sleep on their own um, and they don't pacify on my, on my breast anymore. And they used to do that. So uh, I know that everybody's different because again, like I just said, diversity is the spice of life. Um, and a lot of the times, especially those that have may be, have uh, suffered from sexual trauma can um, put that trauma in their breast or chest. And so that can make breastfeeding or chest feeding pretty difficult. But within the first zero to three or zero to five days, I, I kind of want to keep the dyad together. I want to keep this nursing together. And I want to try to try to get as much nipple stimulation and milk removal as I possibly can in that week. Again, with my main objective to increase prolactin receptor sites. 
Okay, so um, if you have somebody that may have had sexual trauma and is not liking this, that's when a nipple shield is good. And of course, a professional, an IBCLC, or you know, maybe even somebody like me um, that can possibly help um, uh, navigate this along with a, a couple other people that will help be able to process all of that stuff. But there's, those are some big, huge, broad stroke takeaways. Um, what can delay stage two? Um, this is as doulas, I'm sure this is going to be just um, basic knowledge to you. So I'm just going to kind of skin through it, right? Not enough or delayed, no skin to skin, baby not at breasts enough, like baby being passed around with family members, um, grandma holding baby within that first zero to five days. Um, person needs to sleep, we need to allow them to recover. Um, baby uh, needs to be in the nursery or in the box or something like that. All of those things, especially if they're prolonged, will absolutely delay our milk increasing in volume, right? And that's what lactogenesis 2 is. That's when our milk increases in volume. And all of these things can play a role in this. Um, no access to breast pump or not knowing how to do hand expression, uh, premature infants, most specifically because they have a hard time with sucking and breathing at the same time. Um, so that's a challenge for them. And uh, retain placenta again. And remember, uh, like I said, increased circulation of progesterone, which we've already kind of spoken about, and uh, gestational diabetes, which I'll speak to in, in just a second. And then the birth story, of course, sections, just because of, of all of those, all of that that goes along with section births. NICU stays. Uh, fluid overload, um, especially pain medication that can reduce oxytocin release. Does everybody understand what I mean by fluid overload? I know with nurses and, and, and med students, that's kind of a, um, an easier topic, but not all the time do we, we talk about fluid overload. So guard to IV fluids, yes? Mm, yeah, IV fluids. Um, I can't see everybody. And so sometimes I always hate it when people ask me, does everybody know about this is like, if it's not on the slide, talk about it. Don't ask if everybody knows about it, right? So here I am asking if everybody knows about it. <sighs> Good grief, right? Okay, so fluid overload in the most basic of terms, what it means is you're, you, when, you, when you get IV fluids, your cells can only take in so much fluid, right? And the cells will take in all the fluid until they're just like, yo, I have so much fluid, I cannot take any more fluid. And at that point, they start to push the fluid out of their cells. That's called uh, extracellular. So that means it's out of the cells. And so when it becomes extracellular, then the fluid goes to your appendages, uh, which is called edema, edema in your hands, edema in your feet, it's just swelling. And you, you, you sometimes feel like when it's hot, or if you are a person that menstruates, sometimes you have too much fluid and then your ankles get swollen or your fingers, you can't take your rings off. That's very similar. But in this case, in terms of birth, if they get too much fluid, it can be profound, really big fingers, really big uh, feet. And also in this situation, your breasts or chest are also considered a appendage. And so as they start to swell and have extra fluid, it makes it challenging if I, my hands are the fluid and they start to press on the breast or chest, it makes it really challenging for milk to, to travel, right? Because now milk is kind of squished and the ductal pathway that was there that was big and wide is now smaller because um, now there's too much fluid. And in addition to that, your areola becomes puffy um, because of too much fluid. And so if you have a big, huge puffy areola and a small little face, how hard is it going to be for that small little face to get a good effective latch that doesn't cause pain or trauma to that nipple? Mm -hmm. Your risk is going to increase, right? It's going to be harder for that baby to do that. And so right now we have a problem with milk transfer. I'm having a hard time with that milk transferring from my breast or chest into that infant. And then I also am going to have a latch issue right? And that can cause a problem with cre increasing my prolactin receptor sites, right? Because now I can't get milk out and I can't get nipple stimulation. Does everybody understand how that correlates in terms of lactogenesis too and prolactin receptor sites? Um, galactopoiesis, remember what I said that this was um, where 
our supply and demand. Everybody knows that's how we usually think of lactation is that supply and demand. The more frequently you empty your breast or chest, the more milk you will make. Um, and, and this is the phase in which that happens. And that happens nine days after delivery. It does not happen at day one. It happens at nine days at delivery and uh, after delivery. And there are two reasons why. The first one we are already super, super solid on, and that's prolactin receptor sites. I almost want to get like tattooed right here, prolactin receptor sites. So I just have to keep like this the entire time, superhuman prolactin receptor sites. Anyway. Um, the other thing is feedback inhibitor of lactation, which is also known as fill. And they have a cute little saying. Uh, this, the, the saying is take fill out to fill up. And it's ridiculous. And it's a silly saying, but I have, I have nothing better to offer. So you can't call things ridiculous if you have nothing better to offer. So Honestly. that's the saying. <laughs> <clears throat> right? Take fill out to fill up. That will be your homework. Send me uh, uh, another saying about fill and uh, I will put you in my slides and you will be forever memorialized as the person that came up with something better than take fill out to fill up. But what fill does is it changes the shape of the prolactin receptor site. So what prolactin goes to bind to it, it can't because the shape has changed. It's almost trying to stick your plug in a European plug. You know, when you try to stick, stick your, your good old American plug in the European plug, you can't do that, right? You can only stick your American plug in the American hole. And it, it's a very similar situation here. So when Phil is there, you have crossed the pond. You're in Europe because now you're dealing with a European plug and prolactin can't bind to it. If prolactin, site, if prolactin can't bind to it, then it can't stimulate those cuboidal epithelial cells. Therefore, you won't make milk. Uh, here's a cool picture. Uh, the two and the four, those little green blobby doohickey things, um, that would be the prolactin receptor sites and the white is prolactin. Okay, does anybody have any questions on that? When I first talk, when I talk about this, I, I, I like to um, equate it to water, but then we became quarantined and I thought we needed something way different than water. So this can be whatever kind of mixed drink you fathom or you, you desire on a Tuesday night. Um, but I want to kind of speak to you a little bit about, again, language and how important language is. Now, when we talk about an empty breast or chest, that can be challenging to understand, right? Because as soon as I tell somebody you're, you want to empty your breast or chest, then there's this moment in your mind where you're thinking, but if my breast or chest are empty, what if my baby gets hungry? And then I won't have any milk, right? And that's not really what's happening here. And so again, if you need to be aware of your language and how you really describe things. So I like to think of it as a cup right with the faucet on. So if you're, you know, you're, you're filling your cup up with water and you have a straw and you, the faucet's on and you're drinking from the straw, as you continue to drink from the straw, the, the, the rise of the water in the cup will kind of come to an equilibrium, right? Because you're constantly taking water out, right? As it's filling up. But if you stop drinking and the cup can fill all the way to the top, that's when the faucet turns off and we stop making milk so we don't overflow our cup. So we're never not making milk, except when our cup is full. Does everybody understand this? Because this is a big concept to understand that we're never not making milk. It's the same idea that when you get pregnant and you're still nursing somebody else, you're still making colostrum from that earth side baby and you will still have colostrum from when the in utero baby becomes earth side. Everybody knows what earth side means. Every baby is born, they have, they have been birthed, born. Does everybody understand this concept? Yes, so, there's a, a question. So you don't have to wait, quote unquote, for your breasts to be full to feed again. No. So this also is super handy dandy in terms of growth spurts. So babies go through different uh, various growth spurts in the first year of life. And these growth spurts mean that they become more hungry during these parts. And so they nurse more frequently. This nursing more frequently does not mean that you're not making milk. What they're doing is they're signaling to this supply and demand system 
yo, I need more milk. And what happens is that, and you're going to see this more specifically at the four month mark and at the six month mark, those are big, profound growth spurts. And what you're going to see is people say, I'm not making enough milk. And so my question is, why do you think your baby, why do you think you're not making enough milk? And the baby will, they'll say, because the baby keeps nursing more frequently. And so I, I usually say, give it a day, let them nurse as much as they want or increase your pumping if you're an exclusive pumper or increase your pumping if you're working from home and they're draining more from your supply. And what you'll find is the breast or chest will respond with milk increase in milk volume. Okay, so this is the same thing that babies will continue because they're they're pros at it. They are the people that are able to extract the most efficiently. So even though you're not able to get milk out, say of a pump or even hand express, they can. And they're also making signals to increase milk volume. So hopefully I answered that question. We never stop making milk. You never ever stop. You stop making milk when you have a full cup. So Laura, unless someone has like a real pathology, when we're talking about like supply and demand, we're really just talking about like the rate at which the breast fills. Like Correct. I might make milk milk slowly if I'm emptying my breast slowly. I might make it quicker if I'm always emptying it. So I'm really Correct. just trying to, but like I'm gonna I'm gonna make the volume. It's just like how much time does it take, and that's Correct. determined by how often I'm feeding. And then if people Correct. are told they should only feed every two to three hours, and their baby wants to eat more frequently than that at some point, they're gonna have milk, but the baby might be hungry again quickly because they've only had however much time signaled to fill up their breast. And then if they keep feeding, their, their milk production is going to speed up. Exactly. That's exactly it. And, and, and just again, to, to take away that big initial point, unless they have some specific pathology, right? Unless I have increased circulating progesterone, unless I have increased circulation, we'll talk a little bit more about this, unless I have increased circulation of estrogen or testosterone. So if I have somebody that's in the process of transitioning and they want to go back on those hormones in order to continue to transition, this will absolutely impact lactation. Because just like progesterone, estrogen and pro estrogen and testosterone are um, the man, they will always keep prolactin down. This is another reason why when people start their cycle again, that there will be a day or two that their supply will dip because of estrogen, but it will come back up because unless there's any major pathology, if I'm missing glandular tissue, if I'm doing all these things, then there's no other reason why I shouldn't be able to make milk. Yeah. Anybody else have any other questions or concerns? So we are four minutes to the first hour. Do you want oh, to yay. take a five minute breather? I would love to. Is everybody else ready to to do that? I like breaks. Breaks. It keeps you. Yeah, it keeps you have keeps you real. To, have to go to the party. You know? I also have to go. So we're going to get started shortly as soon as Laura comes back. Um, I know there's been some new folks that have joined us towards the end of our first hour. So welcome to you. If somebody can, if one of my uh, assistants can post the, the student's Google Doc so that person can have the notes for this presentation, that would be great. We're good to go, hon, whenever you want to get started. I'm ready. There you go. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so this was actually a really great segue in terms of who might have a hard time with lactation. 
more specifically like uh, what we were saying about the patho, unless there's some kind of specific pathology, pathology reason, pathological reason, that was challenging for my brain, I apologize. Um, then, you know, normally we should expect, especially in galactopoiesis, we should expect a supply and demand uh, type situation. So what we know right now is that gestational diabetes can play a role in terms of a delay in lactogenesis too. So what does that mean? That means that we typically would expect between a zero to two or zero to five day window for which milk will increase in volume. If somebody has been diagnosed with gestational diabetes, that window will increase by 24 hours. So it could be a zero, to, it could be a three to six day window for which someone's milk will increase in volume. And the reason, the reason being is there's a lot of different reasons that people don't really know. Some people say that it's increased uh, adipose tissue, which that kind of makes me unsure. I don't really care for that, but I, I mean, I, you know, research is research, so you can't really um, fight against that. It's just, for me, a lot of the times when we start to say that obese people can't do things or people that have increased adipose tissue in certain areas can't do things, it becomes a little tricky, right? It comes, you yeah. know, saying that somebody is obese, that they can't birth naturally or all those things, right? And, that, and that's, um, that's not something I'm, I'm a huge fan of, but uh, I'm wondering what that increase of adipose tissue, especially if it's a sudden onset, if that happens to squeeze things that weren't normally used to being squeezed, that might be problematic. And I can see how that would play a role. Another thing that there's, the, another reason why they're saying um, there's a delay in lactogenesis too, is that we don't really know about the role of insulin. What is the role of insulin in terms of milk how does that work? And now there's this question of, should we start having insulin and in formula? Um, how, is that playing, how is that playing a role? And, and we just don't know, right? We don't know what that looks like or how that is, but just know that if you are supporting anybody that has gestational diabetes, that this is a potential. Is this a guarantee? No, it's not a guarantee, uh, but it's something you should be aware of and something that you can, uh, you know, hope for the best, but plan for the worst. Another person that might have an issue with, um, with lactation in general, or with an in, a, a decrease in lat or a, a increase in time between lactogenesis one and lactogenesis two is going to be insufficient glandular tissue. And it is exactly what that sounds like. It's just that these people were born with um, ins not enough glandular tissue to make the amount of milk that their infant needs. Um, for a long time, they would be diagnosed by shape. And so that's what these pictures here are um, that the, the variety of shape would tell you the type of insufficient glandular tissue. Um, that's not really happening anymore now. Uh, it's more th that you need to have a scan and most of the time it's gonna have some kind of genetic component. My, my mother, my grandmother, my aunt, somebody in my family which would prompt to want to do more research as to why they would have insufficient glandular tissue. Again, they said, this is normal. I cross that out because I'm normal and you're normal and everybody's normal. Um, PCOS, this is known as polycystic ovarian syndrome. Polycystic ovarian syndrome um, can also contribute to some infertility issues. So this might be like a thing that they were already aware of or have had to navigate in order to even get pregnant. Really what PCOS is, is a, um, in, it's a hormonal imbalance is what it is. It's a, uh, where especially, especially estrogen is impacted where you have too much or too little. And uh, because of that, there's a variety of things that come along with it in terms of irregular periods, ability to ovulate, fertility. And in this case, again, uh, remembering the role of estrogen and how that plays with prolactin can also make it to where people can't make enough milk or um, there's some research showing that because uh, estrogen levels are so low due to PCOS that they have uh, oversupply, that they have too much milk, which is interesting. Um, just putting that out there. So again, in day of life, 
zero to three, baby should be on breast or chest. Any interruption in that can sabotage a person's supply and more specifically their confidence in it. And I hope, I hope, I hope everybody understands why. Do we have any other questions or concerns? I love that picture. Uh, yes, I do. Sorry, I'm like trying to navigate the Google Doc in this. Oh, sorry. Um, yes, I have a question about the previous slide, um, the hypoplasia slide. So <clears throat> it's that there's a difference. Like, I guess having small bursts doesn't necessarily mean like that you can't breastfeed, right? So right. how is this different? I love that question. That's a super great question. It isn't different. And I think that's one of the big takeaways, right? It doesn't matter if you have large, beautiful pendulous breasts or if you have size A cups. If you have the glandular tissue, it makes no difference. The only thing that, that what makes up a breast or chest like in the previous pictures is either fat cells or glands. Those are the two things that make up in, in the most basic of forms. That's what makes up the breast or chest. So if you don't have the glands, then you can't make the milk, but you can have okay. all the fat. The fat can all be there, right? Okay. And you're, you can have, you know, triple F, I don't even know, uh, breast or chest, but if you don't have the glandular tissue. Okay. Cause the drawings kind of made it seem like, I know they're awful that they're like, small breasts because yes my mom and that's small, smaller breasts than even I do and she's she breastfed her five children and she I met so that she had more than enough milk yep I I I an I'm an a cup I, I'd like to say that I was a b cup I did but I was truly an a cup and um I had no problem I it's it's really a glandular thing but this is how they were diagnosed those that may have hypoplasia or insufficient glandular tissue were diagnosed on the evaluation of the tissue itself the the size of the breast or chest and this is the way yeah, in which they evaluated it. okay it's all right thank it's you it's very confusing and it's, it's also very challenging right because these these breasts or chests look very similar to mine Right. But I have, I have, you know what I mean? So that's why I put that on there because this is how people are being evaluated and it's not really uh, accurate. So the only way to accurately know, like um, you were saying earlier is to do the, what was the testing called that you pointed out to? Oh, I, you need to be scanned. Like you need to have like a CT scan or something. Yeah. You need to, or like get a, a mammogram or something to, to really evaluate what is in fact in there. Do you have glandular tissue? Is this just fat tissue? Do you have a genetic predisposition to only have fat and not glands? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That was a great question. And yeah, anybody else have any also other? Also a very rare situation, yeah? I mean, that's very rare. Oh, geez, I don't even know. I can only assume it is rare. Um, because again, if we don't have enough glands, then we as a species wouldn't have made it as far as we have. But I mean, now with the population and um, genetic risk factors and uh, all the all the things, cancer alleys and all these things that are happening with us now, I have no idea the prevalence of this. I would I could only assume that it's very rare. And then the other pieces, folks who've had their breasts made smaller. And Correct. Where the tissue was removed in that surgery, and then they would become they would have they would become uh, insufficient glandular tissue uh, population because they literally got the tissue taken out. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else have any other questions or concerns? Okay. Uh, Usually in breastfeeding or chest feeding positions, uh, we break up into groups and this becomes a really great time for us to kind of get to know each other individually and as a class, but unfortunately we can't do that. And um, I would normally like have you practice with me in person, but we're not gonna do that again today either because I have a lot of other things to, co to cover. So I'm gonna briefly go over this stuff. I, there are some big, huge takeaways from this before I even begin. The first thing is these are not by any means the end all be all in terms of positionings, right? Like uh, the, the dyad can creates their own position, their own system and the own way in which they function. So if I'm giving you these positions and you see somebody that isn't in this position, like 
like for say example, this person, you can't say that's not, you're not doing it right <laughs> because this isn't clutch or football hold that I learned in this class. That's not the point of this. The point of this is that you as a, as a practice practitioner, a, a doula, a, a provider, a parent, you have a, a set of tools in your two belt that you can pull out and use in order to, to achieve a certain thing. Okay, people will create and be inventive and babies definitely uh, play a role in that. So it, uh, the big takeaway, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Okay, if it's working for them, then you stay in your lane. Okay, the, the second thing is any breast or chest feeding position, it, minus the one I'm showing you now, should usually hover, especially in the first month of life, should usually hover within this idea that breast, a uh, belly to belly, chest to chest. I need that baby and person to be close, right? This is a little different, obviously, the picture that you're seeing now, but in the first zero to 30 days, that's, that's where I want to stay, belly to belly, chest to chest. And then the third big takeaway is the comfort, per, the comfort level of the lactating person. I assure you that the lactating person will always compromise their level of comfort in order to achieve a latch or to do this thing correctly, right? But that is not, that you can't do that over time. That is not something that you can have longevity with, right? You have to put their comfort level on your highest priority. If you put it on your highest priority, it will remind them that their comfort level is got to be the highest priority because you're gonna be doing this every two hours, for 24 hours for the first 30 days at least, okay? So they need to be comfortable. So those are the three big takeaways that you need to understand when it comes to breastfeeding and chest feeding positions. Laid back or biological breast or chest feeding. This is uh, a great way for people that have that overactive letdown. Remember we talked about letdowns. That's for those people that instead of milk dribbling out, they can shoot it across the room. These are the people to party with. But you have to remember that it, for smaller babies, it can be challenging. And using gravity to your advantage, right, will be most beneficial for this dyad if this person has an overactive letdown. This is also the position that people will talk or you'll see when you do those, um, when you see those uh, videos of babies doing the breast crawl, that's the position in which they're going. They are put on the, the birthing person's abdomen, the baby can crawl their way up there, and they latch on their own. Nine times out of ten when babies are allowed to self-attach, they usually do it pretty darn well. They're, they've got it. They've got it in the bag. Okay. Clutch or football hold uh, is a great position for those that have large, beautiful pendulous breasts. This allows them to have a little bit more view and control over the situation. You see this person on the far upper left corner of the picture. She can see everything that's going on with her baby in terms of their, their mouth, their nose. She has control uh, over the breast if she needed to and the infant. Uh, this bottom left picture here, this circular pillow is called a boppy or a breast friend. Uh, lots of different companies make them. They're pretty handy dandy in terms of uh, getting baby on there. They can use them as a comfort tool um, to prop babies up. It works out really well. Um, you're going to find that there are two different types of people, people that are, are pillow people and non-pillow people. I am a non-pillow person. I didn't like having pillows with me when I was breast or chest feeding, but then I also co-teach this class over at Samuel Merritt upon occasion. And the person I co-teach it with is a pillow person. If she's called to go help support someone in lactation, she's got 30 pillows in the back of her car or in her trunk, because that's just the way she rolls. She's a nester and um, she uh, is there to support other nesters. Okay, um, the third picture that I kind of want to talk a little bit about before we maybe tackle any questions or concerns is this picture here. Hopefully, again, you can see my mouse. Um, it's the, the middle picture. And what this person is doing here is that we have what's called an SNS. And here, I think I can probably put it in the chat here. Oh, here we go. Yay, SNS. And it's also known as a supplementary nursing system. 
I spent, I, I spelt supplementary wrong. I apologize. But Medela makes these, other people make them. Uh, the purpose here is that the the bottle here is hung upside down. And I don't know if you can see, but there's a, like a, 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 like a rope, a necklace, I call it, a, you know, like a soap on a rope type situation. And it's attached to the bottle so it can hang around that lactating person's neck. There's a small tube that's attached to the bottle. And what happens is they tape it so that it runs flush. Hopefully you can see, so if my finger is the tube, it runs flush with the nipple. So that when baby latches on, right, they're getting nipple stimulation, they're getting milk removal, but they're also being supplemented with whatever is in this bottle, hopefully expressed or donor milk, but it can be formula. What this does is it allows for a lot of things to happen. It allows for people that may have insufficient glandular tissue or low milk supply to continue to nurse and supplement and have that experience. This allows for our adoptive parents or maybe LGBTQAI community members that want to initiate lactation outside of having given birth, this allows for this process to happen as well. It's it's a it's a win-win, and also it's it from what I understand, it's pretty easy to make it home if you are one of those DIY kind of people. Okay, anybody have any questions or concerns about clutch or football hold? Cradle hold, cradle hold is probably the most common breast or chest feeding position. It's most, especially one that you see. I'm sure that when you thought about this class before you saw my face, you thought about somebody breastfeeding or chest feeding in a cradle hold position. Unfortunately, it is one of the most challenging positions to get in and can be even more difficult if you have those beautiful, large pendulous breasts. It's more, it's, it's challenging in part because here I have, I have Grover, he's my support person and uh, Grover is excellent, especially in terms of positioning. But what makes it really challenging here is that hopefully you can see that Grover here, um, I, I don't really have a whole lot of tr control over Grover, right? I can't really control or support his neck. You know, he could be flopping around with all of his hands in his face because that's what babies do. And I also really, when I'm trying to get a good latch, it's hard for me to get control over my breast and chest. And now I can't even see a lot of Grover's face, which makes it challenging for me to see what's happening with his lips is he sucking in a lip on the other side? I don't really know what's going on. And again, I don't have a whole lot of control here. And that makes it challenging, especially for those of us that are just learning how to do all of these things, right? But what you can do is what's called cross cradle hold. And this really works out well when I'm supporting people and they're saying, you know, I'm having a hard time with positioning and latch. Um, can you help me out? And they start off in this position, right? And so it, for, for me, instead of saying, oh, you know, that's a really hard position to get in. You probably shouldn't do that. I'm going to say, oh, you got some great instincts. I really like what you're doing here because you're already chest to chest, belly to belly. That's number one. And your comfort level is there. You're ready. You're comfortable. That's number two. I got two out of the three things that I got checked off, right? But it is broken. So I do need to come in here and fix it for a second. And the best way to do that is by transitioning this person into cross cradle hold. And I'll do that by, if I want to nurse on my right breast, I'm going to take my left hand and I'm going to put it here in the, between the small of Grover's back so I can support his neck and keep my hands in between his shoulder blades. Then I'm going to take my right hand and here I have full control over my breast or chest. Now I can do my C shape or my U shape if I need to. And we'll talk more about that in a second. I can manipulate my breast in any way that I see fit because in order for me to get that latch. Does somebody have a question? No. Okay. So the reason why they call it cross cradle is because I have the my right breast that's being nursed and I'm holding Grover with my left hand. So this is crossed, okay? And if I were to do it vice versa, if Grover would be on my left breast, then I'm gonna use my right hand and that's how it's crossed. Does everybody understand this concept? Hopefully you do. So here we go back on my right breast and I am comfortable and I have a really great latch. I'm feeling really good about this latch. I can remove my hand if I would like and now I can put it, wrap it back around and now I'm in cradle again. Does everybody see how I did that? Here is my cross, here is my cradle and I'm e I can easily transition between the two and Grover can just stay exactly where I want Grover to stay. Everybody understand where I'm at? 
Yes, that actually, I actually have a question about football hold this made me think of. Um, do you do like, how's the chest, like I know belly to belly, chest to chest, but in football yeah. hold, how does that look? Yeah, 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 that's a great question. So football hold again, works really well with those of us that have large pendulous breasts. I don't, I have to supplement. So I, I usually try to demonstrate it this way. So I have my beautiful large pendulous breast and Grover here, his belly and chest is touching my side, belly and chest. And so here we are super close. And again, my hands right here behind Grover and I'm here to supplement. Mm. Hopefully you can see. And here I've got, man, I've got full control over the situation here. Everything's rocking and rolling. Nothing's getting out of my hands. This works out really well, again, for full control. And as a side note, what I will also say is those of us that have large, beautiful pendulous breasts, another good key because again, when we're first learning this, all of these little details become too much, especially if you have zero sleep, right? And so what I do for my large pendulous breast community members is I'll take a towel or one of those swaddling blankets and I'll roll it up like a Tootsie Roll and I'll put it underneath the meat of the breast or chest. So now I've created like this table so that when I move my hand, it doesn't fall down right? It stays right where I'm at. And now I can focus on my latch. I can focus on all things because the breast is going to stay where I want it to stay. And then they don't have to worry about that. Now, in a couple of days, they'll, they'll have mastered all the things and they can navigate their breast or chest falling, but let's set people up for success. And the towel trick is a really good trick to use. Did I answer your question about the clutch or football hold? Yeah. Sure you just, Thank you. That was great. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the big takeaway here really is um, close, close, close comfort. And if it ain't broke, right? Okay. <clears throat> oh, and so I, I try to have as many pictures and in, in uh, solidarity to my, uh, my other co-partner, Brandy Beasley, who's the pillow person. I always try to have pictures of pillows because, you know, got to represent. So yeah, this person here on the right, she's staring off into the distance. She's contemplating humanity. She's cross cradle. And then this person here on the left has the pillow because they're clearly a nester pillow person. Okay. So you are all, you all are obviously experts in positioning. So I have this picture and I want you, if this was your client, I would like for you to assess this person and shout out to me your thoughts. Does this look comfortable? Is this look like a good position? If you saw this, would you give this person a high five? Would you try to adjust them? And if you were to adjust them, why? And you can put it in the chat if you don't want to talk, but it would be good for some kind of shout out. <laughs> It's it looks great. The only thing I would say is that she looks a bit hunched over. So the comfort piece is missing. I agree with that. Right. How long can you stay in that position? How long does that look like? And so th that's excellent. One of the things I would, this is another saying that is in the lactating world is, is you want it, uh, don't bring breast to baby, bring baby to breast, right? Again, not one of my favorite sayings, but that's what it is. This person is bringing their breast or chest to their baby instead of bringing their baby to the, ba to the breast or chest. And that's something that we need to really emphasize because we want to have that level of comfort. That's exactly correct. Anybody else have any other, um, does it, can anybody give a shout out as to what position this might be in? I was just going to add that her hand is on the back of the baby's head as opposed yeah. to hers. That's exactly it, right? That baby has no option to pull their head back. And with some babies, again, because we're all different and diversity is the spice of life, uh, some babies don't like that. They don't, do, they don't do well that way. They don't thrive that way. And so we, we don't want to do that. Right, exactly. Anybody else have any other suggestions? Uh, I can't tell from this image, but if I was standing in front of them, doesn't really look like the belly like it looks like the baby's totally horizontal without a little yeah. bit of tilt with yeah. the 
they're closer to the mom's belly or like their feet more towards the floor just support yeah digestion yep I like that that's perfect right we, we're kind of in this weird predicament and it's kind of this weird like baby boob sandwich and you know in general that sounds great and all fine and dandy but when it comes to practicality and implementation of a good latch and good positioning this isn't really hitting that mark that's exactly it Anybody else want to contribute or maybe even give a shout out to maybe what position this person might be in? Does anybody know? Cross cradle. Cross cradle. Cross cradle. Oh, look at y'all. 7.30 on a Tuesday. Knocking it out of the park. That's it. Cross cradle. That's right. That person's using their right breast and their left hand. Right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. I think so. Okay. Anybody have any questions or concerns about that? So side laying is exactly as it sounds, side laying. Baby's laying on the side. And in most cases, baby can self-attach. Um, we want to make sure that this person practices safety in all aspects, right? We want to practice ergonomics, making sure that maybe there's a pillow in between the hips to keep the hips straight. We want to watch where that hand is. I tried to get different pictures of where that arm is. With my first, I, I did side laying. We did some um, safe co-sleeping. And I knocked my shoulder out of whack because I fell asleep like in one one of these positions and I had to go to a chiropractor to get things snapped back. That sucked. Don't let other people make the same mistake I did. Okay. We want to make sure that we practice good, safe ergonomics and uh, side laying. And in addition to that, we also want to practice good safety, right? If baby is going to be laying in bed, we want to make sure that that person hasn't ingested anything, that they're not smoking anything, that there isn't any blankets or anything going up, up to their head to cover that baby. And we also want to make sure that there aren't any pillows near that baby. Now, uh, proper safety in terms of co-sleeping is an entirely different class. And that's not something I'm going to talk much about. But it is my job to tell you that proper safety must be utilized at all times in this position. Here's another breakdown, um, just so you can understand how that works from a top angle. Tandem nursing. Uh, tandem nursing just means that somebody is nursing more than one person. So if you hear, I'm tandem nursing, that just means they're nursing maybe their baby, their toddler and their infant, that they're nursing multiples they're nursing their baby and their next door neighbor's baby. Somebody else is benefiting from the milk that is coming out of their breast or chest, more than one person. I have this because I, I kind of just want to go back a minute when we talked about fluid overload and we talked about um, puffy nipples. Uh, figure three is exactly what that looks like. I just want to kind of give you a, a, a picture. Plus this is a super awesome picture. I like this picture. Uh, figure one that said normal again, I'm normal, you're normal, everybody's normal. This is an everted nipple. It's not normal, okay? Anybody else, uh, everything else here, there shouldn't be any problems with anybody having uh, latch issues. Inverted nipples are really just inverted. They come out on suction. So when any, anytime somebody sucks on them, um, they will come out. Um, I call them the jack in the box of nipples. Uh, they just say everything, everything here works fine. Uh, Montgomery glands. So Montgomery glands are, this is the reason why we, people tell you not to wash your nipples, more specifically not to wash them with uh, anything that smells like something like uh, lavender or anything else of the sort, because it will mask Montgomery glands. Montgomery glands secrete a fluid that is used for lubrication, but also this fluid is has a very specific odor. Um, what they're saying it's a very it's a odor that may be similar to amniotic fluid. So there's a study in the reference guide that you have that um, uh, that gives a 24 hour old infant it has it smell its own mother's Montgomery gland secretions another human's Montgomery gland secretions and, and several other different mammals Montgomery gland secretions to see if the baby shows any feeding cues. And what they found is that the baby only showed feeding cues with its own mother's Montgomery gland secretions. So it isn't just a human specific smell, it's a very person, baby specific, a dyad specific smell. Mm -hmm. and, and this again is to attract baby to the breast or chest. Okay, anybody have any questions or concerns about positioning? 
I'm good on time, Simsar. We don't need another break, right? Um, you're at 734. Okay, so, so we're, we're good to go. You. I'll check in with you at eight to see how I'm ready. Okay, perfect. Just wanna make sure that I'm plugging along. Okay, so ah. Latch, awesome. I like to hear that. So latch, um, the saying goes, again, another one of those super awesome lactation sayings is uh, nose to chin, then roll it in. Again, also just as lame as all the other ones I've introduced today. So I'm, I'm, I'm uh, keeping it consistent uh, to say the least. And so nose to chin and roll it in. The reason why they say nose to chin is really because we're trying to achieve what's called an asymmetrical latch. Meaning I don't want baby to go straight onto the nipple. I want it to come at an angle because I want it to latch on at an angle. The reason why I want it to latch on at an angle is because that's how I'm gonna get the most amount of breast tissue within that baby. Um, Cause that's how I'm gonna get an effective milk transfer. And I'll go way more into that in just a second. So to start off nose to chin, that means I want baby to only, when we first are setting everything up, we've got a good position, right? I want to start with the chin touching the breast, nothing else, the baby's chin touching the breast. As a result, you see that it, that's why Grover is super so helpful in this situation, that the nipple is now pointing at the nose. So nose to chin. It is this position here that the baby will reach up and over to try to get that nipple, right? And will roll it in. As a result, I'll have more areola on top, more areola on top, less areola on the bottom. Okay, those are all the things that I want to see. So when I'm looking at a latch, the first thing I'm looking at is, is this person comfortable? Do they have a good position? Are they chest to chest, belly to belly, except for clutch or football hole, because remember that's going to be side belly. And do I see more areola on top, less areola on the bottom? Okay. Now, the, this slide also talks about holding the breast with a C or a U. This again goes back to if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If somebody's doing a C and they have a perfect latch and great positioning, when they should be using a U, then that's when that's a U problem, not a them problem, right? They, it, they don't need to have anything if it, if it ain't broke, right? But the reason why they're saying a C or a U is that this will help will get more breast tissue into the baby. So if the baby's mouth is faced this way, we're gonna do a C. If the baby's mouth is faced this way, then I'm going to do a U, okay? That's all that means. Again, if they're doing a C when they should be doing a U or vice versa, it doesn't matter, okay? Laura, would you, would you do that again? You, when they're facing this way, it's a this and... Yeah, so if my baby is facing this way, okay, if Grover's facing this way, his mouth is up and down, right? So I want to do a U because he's facing this way. Does that make sense? Everybody got it? Okay. Yeah. But again, if Grover's facing this way and I'm doing a uh, a C, right? Does and it works and everything is fine and that's okay too. Okay. What I don't want to see is like something like this. I don't want fingers in in on areolas. I don't want like fingers being pulled back or anything like that. Either you're going to hold the breast tissue back here or you're or because that's how you're going to get control. You don't get control through the areola. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. You're very welcome. Now there's way more to this because if you're thinking like this chick's whack and I don't know what the heck she's saying, I tr trust me, there's a lot more to what I'm saying. So just bear with me. So I tried to get as many pictures of this beginning process and I tried to get as many big breasts and chests and little tiny faces because I feel like that's the most intimidating factor. When you look at these large breasts or chests and that little tiny face, you're like, nope. This is not going to work. That's a little face. This is never going to work, but it works, okay? So this bottom left-hand picture, look, the chin was already touching. That nose was almost equal to the nipple until that baby reached up and over. Notice I have more areola on top, less areola on the bottom. Everybody understand that? Now, 
everybody's areola is different because remember, diversity is the spice of life. Okay, so don't judge people on their areola. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. I should just have more areola on top, less area. It doesn't matter if the whole entire breast is areola. I should have more of it on top and less of it on the bottom. Everybody understand that concept? I hope so. Okay, I see a thumbs up hot damn, thank you. So here on the top left hand side, here's that step to step. Babies touching, baby's chin is touching the breast or chest. As a result, the nose is equal with the nipple, right? Baby tries to reach up and over again. Chin is still touching. Now I have more areola on top, less areola on the bottom. Here, the final result being, again, more areola on top, even though it's just a little sliver, that's okay. More areola on top, less on the bottom. Notice how the hand is in between the shoulder blades, supporting the neck, but not the head, right? Okay, same with these pictures on the right, where the nipple is pointed and what part of the breast is touching the baby. This is what's going to set you up into an asymmetrical latch. Another thing that I wanna to try to achieve is fish lips. This person on the left hand side is doing it perfectly because I want to try to create an airtight seal. Now, babies do not extract milk via suction, okay? They hang on by suction or an airtight seal, but they do not extract milk via suction. They extract milk via compression. So when I hear of people using pumps, which extract milk via suction, and that they are, are unable to get milk out, or that they're only able to get out a certain amount of milk, that is normal, because our breasts or chests are not made to respond to suction. We are meant to respond to compression. That's why hand expression is far more efficient in terms of time, but also in terms of milk composition than pumping. Research is beginning to show that fat content is less in that of pumped milk than it is in comparison to hand expressed milk, because that's how babies get milk out via compression. So I want to get as much breast tissue in that infant's mouth in order for them to do compression. Because when you see a baby nurse, they aren't sucking like you do on a straw. They are compressing onto the breast tissue. But I want to get an airtight seal with this fish lips. In order for them to do breast compression, I need for that tongue to come up and over the gum line. And that is what this picture here on the right is. This tongue is coming up and over the gum line. This allows for the tongue to press the breast tissue against the roof of the mouth and protect those bottom teeth from the breast tissue, okay? Again, babies extract milk via suction. Let's see, I need to, sorry, I had to move my view here. There we go, perfect. So I apologize. So babies extract milk via compression, but they're not compressing with their mouth. That's not what they're doing. They are using their tongue to press the breast tissue against the hard palate of the mouth, okay? so the hard palate of the mouth is that hard part when you're talking or even when you click. That's my tongue hitting the hard palate of my mouth. Now, if I were to take my finger and go a little bit back right before you hit that gag reflex, that is the soft palate of the mouth. I need the nipple to go into the soft palate of the mouth. When the nipple, say if my knuckles here is the soft palate of the mouth, when, and this is the hard palate here, the tongue will press that breast tissue against the hard palate of the mouth. If the tongue is in the soft palate, then it's, it's protected, it's comforted, right? It's not being pinched against the tongue as it goes and presses against the hard palate of the mouth. So then when I remove my breast or the nipple, the nipple won't come out pinched or elongated because it wasn't even touched by the tongue, okay? But if I have a shallow latch, again, this is my tongue and this is the hard palate of the mouth, oh. then it's gonna pinch 
and pinch against the nipple. Hopefully you can see that. And this is what causes nipple damage and trauma, okay? I have more videos. I have, I have lots of other things to kind of hit this home, but I wanted to like talk it out before we started watching. Does anybody have any questions on this initially? Is this challenging to understand at 7.45 on a Tuesday? Is everybody okay? I send virtual hugs, self high it's fives. Okay. It's, it's okay. good. Okay, good. Okay, thank you. I'm right, good. Thank you for the feedback. That's really, really good. Okay, so I have this um, video. Hopefully you can hear it. I think somebody's going to tell me I'm going to turn my headphones off, and that's okay if that's the case. Um, this is a 24-hour-old infant, and right now they are doing everything that we have just talked about with the chin touching the breast, nipple to the nose, right? And then um, you're gonna see this baby try to latch, get an asymmetrical latch. So I see more areola on top, less areola on the bottom, okay? Uh, I'm gonna try and play it. If somebody could give me a thumbs up, uh, Simsara, I can see you. If you can let me know if you could hear it, that'd be awesome. If not, I'll have to turn my headphones off, okay? Um just nice and snug here. Can you hear it? So if you'd like to do cross cradle, you it's, get your hand supporting your breast. The big sister's going to help us. Chin touching. And you're going to just gen gently run the nipple on these upper Okay, lips more areola on top. Wait for to open wide. Wait for to open nice and wide. And then bring him in from his back. Okay, now it could be, a, let's let him come off because that wasn't as good as it could have been and he says also. So run the nipple on slowly. And deeper from the back and squeeze the breast. Squeeze, squeeze, squeeze as he comes on. So it's not my hands in there, but your hands. Aww. Yeah. Nice drinking already. So cute. There. You see how the chin drops down and pauses? There. Try the compression now. Position. Get a good handful of breast and get the milk flowing. There's a mouthful. Is that Dr. There. Jack? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's Dr. Dr. Yeah, this is Dr. Jack Newman. All of these videos are available on his website. You can download them for free. So they are absolutely available to you, including this little scenario here. So again, I know I'm super difficult to watch movies with. You never wanna watch because I'm gonna talk and I'm gonna yell and I'm get so excited. So that's just the way it is. But yeah, you did, you saw, you saw the chin touching, more areola on top, less on the bottom. You saw that that baby was pretty pissed off, right? And so this goes again back to early signs of feeding cues. And I'll talk to talk more about that in this and when I I'll talk more about that in a minute Ugh. Um, but right now I really want to do the big takeaway was the setup another thing that I want to have as a big takeaway from this is when they were doing breast compressions when they were doing compressions what is happening when 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 they said start squeezing the breast do those breast compressions at the base of the breast what do you think is happening there Anybody want to take a stab at it? Baby's getting a big mouthful of milk. Yeah, that's Jesus. right. We are we Mom are physically the milk come through. Mom is yes. to, to make sure that the milk continues to flow so the baby doesn't get little short spurts of milk. That's correct. That's correct. We are physically outside of doing milk ejection reflex, right? So this is not a hormonal reaction. This is us physically taking pressure and moving milk down the ductal system, right? There's, this is a huge, this is a huge deal, especially in the first zero to five, or I'd even be, I would even be close to say the first, the first two weeks of this relationship. Because one big thing to remember is if you see a baby fall asleep at the breast, that means no milk is going out of the breast. Every time I see a baby asleep, that means they aren't nursing. So when I hear people saying, well, my baby's sleepy, every time I put them on the breast, they fall asleep. That means milk isn't flowing. So what does that tell me? That tells me I have a milk transfer issue. Is this person making enough milk? Is this person having a milk ejection reflex? Is this person having an oxytocin problem? Do they have a 
is they do they not have enough oxytocin do they have an oxytocin issue are they being medicated to where there is no oxytocin release um all of these things but that's the first thing i'm gonna do when as soon as i start to see that baby fall asleep i'm gonna start pushing milk out of that breast converse to that this baby is far from asleep this baby is pissed off so i'm going to tell this baby yo dog chill. I'm going to squeeze the breast. I'm going to let you know you're going to get instant gratification, instant reward, instant milk right now. And that's what you saw. He was like, oh, and when he grabs this boob on the side, I get teary eyed. Every time I see this video, I get teary eyed. I've seen this video for like 10 years. I still get teary eyed. Anybody have any questions or concerns about what they saw today in this video? Uh, really? This is um, just yeah, yeah, yeah. Question. for a little bit for like, you know, like I know you said for the first two weeks, um, like when you get into like the two month mark or whatever, where babies start to fall asleep and their sleep cycles are shorter and they do start to fall asleep at the breast, even whether it be at the beginning of the feed, middle, whatever. And they say like tickle their feet or whatever it is, try to, you know, take their clothes off, all that kind of stuff. Will your first line of defense be to instruct mom to do some Squeeze breast press. compression? Okay. All right. And then that's always, that's always my jump. Absolutely. 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 That's always the first thing I'm going to say to you when you call me and say, baby keeps falling asleep at the breast. That's what I'm going to say to you. That's what I'm going to say to her. That's always my, that's what I do in the hospital on um, postpartum baby falls asleep, squeeze, 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 squeeze. Baby wakes up, baby starts actively drinking, come back, tell them to do it again. Okay. This is, uh, this is what the tongue is doing. Sorry. It's like the, it's like the worm. Oh, did you have a question? Hold on a second. Yeah. So, you know, when they're first, first born, they're brand new newborns and they're trying to get their first latch going and they almost always suck, suck, stop. Yeah. And then like, sometimes we do the little cheek stroke is, would yeah. it be better to be doing that hand compression on the breast? Yep, 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 yep. Because that's that immediate reward. Because it, again, it goes back to if you fall asleep eating, right? <laughs> and something starts going down your throat, you're going to wake up. You're going to wake up. Babies are no different, right? And so they're either going to be like, oh, oh, I got to keep drinking. I got to keep drinking. Or they're going to pop off. I don't want anymore. I'm too tired. I don't want to do this anymore, right? There's two things that are going to happen. And objectively, baby's got to stay on breast, especially in that first zero to five days specifically, right? And that's where I want that. That's when I would do breast compressions constantly. Yeah. And, and then when you're like, oh, I can't do it on this breast or chest anymore. That's when you switch sides, do that again. And you just keep doing the switch back and the switch forth. Mm -hmm. And is there any special technique for that compression no no you just take yeah oh, i don't know why i keep doing it to, i keep doing it to myself and you're like your sweater i can't see anything yeah so here it so i'm taking my so i have my chest wall i'm taking it from the base of the breast this is what's closest to my chest wall and i'm i'm pushing it down i'm just squeeze from one side pushing that down and then the other side pushing that down trying to get as much of the sections cleared out of the breast as i possibly can and and of course um oxytocin is going to help me with that right i'm going to have a milk ejection reflex and oxytocin is going to help me flood that system this is just a really great jump start and it's that immediate gratification it's that immediate reward that that's what that infant's looking for right now especially in the situation where that baby was angry Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. Anybody else have any other questions or concerns? Or do you want to see the worm again? I, uh, again, the, this is exactly what the tongue is doing inside the baby's mouth. The nipple is going to be all the way back here. And that tongue is pressing up against that breast tissue up against the hard palate of the mouth. <laughs> it's kind of funny, actually. Okay, mm -hmm. I, have, I, I have another picture too. Hold on. Okay, here we go again. Okay, so here we are. Soft palate of the mouth, hard palate of the mouth. Okay, here's the tongue up and over that gum line. Everybody see that? And that tongue is going to press this breast tissue right here. That's where this tongue is gonna come up and press. And where the nipple is situated, it's right there at the back of the throat. So the milk at this point has no choice but to go back into the esophagus it automatically just opens up. So when I hear of babies 
that people, you know, people say, oh, they have, uh, you know, uh, a strong milk ejection reflex, right? Or a strong letdown. What that really tells me is that if that nipple was pushed back a little bit, or I'm sorry, if they had a more shallow latch, then the milk is shooting in the back of their throat and they feel like they're drowning, right? Like just as if you were um, to take a squirt bottle and squirt it in the back of your mouth, right? You'd be like, <laughs> right? But if like those times when you're really thirsty and you slam down that water, it's almost like your throat opens up because you're trying to drink that water quickly. It's the same situation here. It's a reflex that you have within your mouth that allows for that milk to go straight into the esophagus. Okay, I'll keep playing this. I know I keep talking. See, the angle at which the milk hits pushes that open, goes down the esophagus. That's the soft palate of the mouth right there in the far left. That tongue is pressing that breast tissue and that nipple is completely and totally safe in the back of that tongue, okay? Does everybody understand this concept? This is a really great video to kind of hit home. Do you need me to play it again? Laura, so it sounds like you're saying in the case of, um, a fast flow or fast like milk ejection. Um, I mean, a latch is still really important and important to avoid kind of the sputtering, choking. Yeah, that's the, exactly. The sputtering, choking is like that the latch isn't quite deep enough. The, the, whenever I see a baby and, and, and I see the person having a milk ejection reflex, because I can see it, you can see it, you'll see it in a minute, but you can see it change. The baby's mouth goes from fast, rapid sucks to these deep sucks because they're drinking, actively drinking, just the same as when you're drinking a glass of water. You notice that it, and notice yourself drinking tonight when you go to bed or before you go to bed and you have that glass of water because you always have a glass of water before you go to bed but you should you'll notice that your chin drops down because that's actively drinking babies are no different at the breast the chin's going to drop down because your mouth is opening up and it's going to go in the back of your throat when i see that happening and i see babies immediately pull back or they cry that tells me shallow latch I need to get more breast tissue back there because if I can get that milk to shoot in the back of that throat more specifically to allow that to open up, just like in the video that we saw, then we shouldn't have any choking. But if baby doesn't, if baby feels that milk shoot in a different part of their mouth, then it's an automatic, I'm drowning. We're, we're basically waterboarding this poor thing. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. Anybody else have any other questions or concerns? I have a question. Yeah, yeah. Um, my, I have a two-year-old and I actually had pretty bad um, experience breastfeeding my two-year-old. Um, even though it was my second go around, it was, it was a challenging time. And um, so I experienced a lot of pain and to this day, she has trouble. Like she coughs a lot. She'll, she'll um, drink something too fast or too much. And I'm wondering if there is any relationship between that experience breastfeeding and her her intake of fluids now you know I stopped breastfeeding her at like a year and a half so she'll be three in March and I'm just wondering if there's any like long-term impact that that might have for her that's that's a great question and I I first just want to applaud you for muscling through what, what sounded like a pretty challenging time for an entire year and a half. That's amazing. And uh, just kind of want to take that moment to, um, to revel in your awesomeness. Um, in addition to that, though, there are a variety of reasons why babies may have a hard time latching. And one of them uh, is, you know, could be tongue tie or lip tie, which allow, it doesn't allow the tongue to go up and over that gum line. And there are varying degrees of tongue ties to which some can be almost like debilitating and others can be maybe not as noticeable. And as a result, it can impact things beyond breast or chest feeding. It impacts speech. It impacts sleep. Some babies are there. People are more prone to sleep apnea um, if they have uh, varying degrees of tongue tie or lip tie. And it can also impact their ability to eat. Right. So that could be one reason. And um, I, 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 
it wouldn't be surprising to me to find some kind of correlation between their ability, your your child's ability to drink now, and their issues with um, with nursing efficiently um, with you when they were infants. That um, that is absolutely a reasonable association. Thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. Anybody else have any other? Yeah. Well, now that you brought up the tongue tie and lip tie, um, I feel like all of a sudden everybody is like saying that their baby has a tongue tie and it's become, yeah. how common, like, do we have statistics on how common it is? That's so cool. That's such a great question. And I, you know, to be honest, I bet you 10 bucks, I'm sorry, we'll be able to speak a little bit more to this, but um, for the longest time, midwives were cutting them. Um, so the data that we have on that, especially in terms of early lactation and, and latch and what we know uh, is pretty skewed because if you gave birth at home, <laughs> then uh, all the midwives were slicing frenulums well before we could even assess it because it was just something that they did. It's just a part of the mm -hmm. part of the process. Yeah. Uh, and so um uh, I don't have a lot of data. I think the, the, in this kind of, this is the same thing. So um, I, I was a dancer in a previous life and people always ask me, you know, how do you feel about those? Um, so you think you can dance shows on television or dancing with the stars, right? And uh, the, the big takeaway is, I love that people are getting more involved in dance. Dance is awesome, right? Same thing with this. I love that people are being more aware of tongue tie, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that you're a good dancer. Uh, <laughs> and this by no means is a, uh, a holistic view of dance at all. Uh, it's a very privileged, tiny part of dance, but it's still dance. And so same with tongue tie. People are more on the lookout, which is great. I'm glad that they're more on the lookout. Does that mean it's more prevalent? Meh. Same thing with ADHD. I don't, you know, I, I'm not, not going to make those associations. There's a financial piece too around, well, this is another procedure that medical folks can do. So it's really hard for parents to discern what is really real for their kid and what's, what's not. And so right. I, I do wish we could remove that financial piece from this and so it could be cleaner around whether you, you know, but the families that I know personally who their kids were diagnosed with a tie and they did something about it report that breastfeeding got easier after that was addressed so I go with that. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, on a side note to that though I don't think everything is tongue tie or lip tie. I do think part of the other side of this could be lack of support education and um within lactation itself, more specifically outside of the hospital setting, right? You can be in a hospital and postpartum and you get to see a lactation consultant for an hour in the two days that you are there or three days that you are there, right? right? And you may have gotten a grip on it then when you've had nurses and lactation consultants and pediatricians come in and assess and support and help. It's that time when you get home when the shit hits the fan, right? And then that's where I don't remember how to do this. I'm exhausted. My partner doesn't know. Uh, I don't have a partner. Um, my, my mother did not breastfeed me. And so they're pushing formula because that was their norm. Right. All of these other variables and factors that contribute to people mm -hmm. um, not truly just not being supported. So I don't think everything is tongue tie or lip tie. I do think that poor latches um, in part are due to lack of support and education. So just Out. to a time check, it is 8.03. Do you want to take a five minute? I would love to. Does, does everybody need a five minute stretch, go potty? If nobody needs it, I can muscle through it. But if people need it, then um, we should go. We should definitely take it. It's a it. good thing to not power through things. I'm trying to teach people not to be doing that. I like that. I like boundaries. Yeah. They make me happy. They really do. So, you yeah. know, let's do five minutes. And if folks want to ask you some questions during that time, if, you, if you're if you willing to stay, then that's yeah. cool. But we're, we're just going to have an official five minute break. That means we're going to start again at 8.08. 8.08. It's like the bass. I know. We got that 8.08 drum. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
Does anybody have any questions or concerns or anything? I can I can read the chat. I don't get to read the chat. I'll do sure. that. Is there anything in there? Oh, great. And we are back on. Okay, awesome. So moving on and continuing with latch, um, I have, uh, this is a latch score. I'm just gonna go over this very briefly because this is what I teach nurses and med students as well. In a hospital, you are given a latch score and the latch score is based off of, can they hear audible swallowing? Does, does the baby attempt to latch? At, what kind of nipple does this person have? Are they comfortable? Like meaning are the nipples damaged? And did they need any help getting into positions? And so you are being assessed, you being the birthing person, the lactating person are being assessed on these criteria. The lower the score you have, the, the um, more likely you will be referred to a lactation consultant. If you have a higher score, then you won't be referred to a lactation consultant. What is the score, may I ask, from what to what? Oh, here it is right here. Oh, so it's a zero to one to two. So here we have um, the latch being too sleepy or reluctant or re re uh, repeated attempts, but can't or grasps, holds in, tongues phalange, rhythmic sucking, so they get a two. Uh, audible, no, audible swallowing, so on and so forth, okay? So this is how you're being assessed in a hospital. And this is what I teach nurses and uh, med students. So now you all are experts in uh, latch and positioning. So I have a client here that's come to you that's saying that baby's having a hard time. And so you as the experts will evaluate and assess this infant. For the nurses and the med students, I have them use the latch score. We can play with the latch score if you feel froggy. Uh, otherwise, um, we can just discuss. Okay, is everybody ready? Are you excited? I'm excited. Okay, this is going to require for you to do a lot of listening. So if you can't hear, uh, let me know. Okay, and turn your speakers up, turn your volume up. Here we go. I think this is all the way up to let me just make sure. Okay, here we go. Okay, experts, I'll put up the latch score should you want to assess this way or we can just have a discussion. Uh, let, you wanna shout, give me a shout out on some specific thoughts. Like what, what are your first things? What are the first things jumping into your brain? I kind of was thinking, am I supposed to be hearing the smack, smack, smack? That's right. No, right? No, no, because if I hear the smack, that means is it? That means my tongue is hitting the hard palate of my mouth. If my tongue is hitting the hard palate of my mouth, where's the nipple? The in nipple front. is too, too shallow. That's right, Jesse. Look yeah. at you. That's right. It's in front. It's too shallow, right? That means that the that means that that yeah, that means that nipple is being pressed and pinched and hit against the tongue, which will cause damage and trauma, right? Cause it to be a deeper latch. Okay, I need I need a deeper latch. This person has been uh, diagnosed with an overactive letdown. Too what else do you see? Take it from a fire hose. It's, they don't have a um, asymmetrical latch. I guess that's, that's correct. They just... don't have an asymmetrical latch. 
I, I can't see who that is, but they were absolutely correct, right? You can see, I don't see, I see equal areola. I actually kind of don't see any areola, right? But that baby is straight on, right? I don't see the chin touching. Look, there's a bit of a gap here. Hopefully you can see my pointer finger. There's a bit of a gap with the nipple, or I'm sorry, with the chin and the breast tissue. And that nose is, is smushed in there. The baby can breathe, they're not gonna suffocate, but that nose is touching way more than that chin. That's no bueno. Fish lips. We don't see any fish lips. I don't see any fish lips. Excellent. Excellent. Anybody else? All right. Let's let's try and play the game. Let's play the game of the latch score. Because we've already identified like this is potentially a shallow latch. It's definitely not asymmetrical. So we know that that's kind of setting people up to not succeed, right? And um, we know that positioning could be problematic from what we saw, right? And then there's a moment in which about halfway through the video, and we'll play it again, about halfway through the video, that baby had to take a break, right? Almost like they were gonna cry. They took a breath, they're like, this is a lot. It's a lot of milk coming me all at once. I'm kind of freaking out, kind of not liking where I'm at right now, right? Did everybody get that feeling? Almost like this panicky moment, right? Yeah. Okay, so now we know all of those things. We've had our own internal assessment. Let's play the rule. Let's play the, the institutional assessment. So latch, uh, was this baby too sleepy? No. Uh, was this baby doing repeat, repeated attempts to sustain a latch? No. They definitely grabbed the breast. The tongue was down. The lips were kind of phalanged, right? Uh, but I did see rhythmical sucking. So I, I, unless y'all disagree, I'm gonna give this baby a two. Everybody, everybody, is, I, I, if you disagree, two. you're gonna have to give me a shout out. Be like, you're crazy. Okay, audible swallowing. Uh, I heard, I did hear audible swallowing. I heard spontaneous and intermittent or frequent audible swallowing. Did anybody not hear audible swallowing? So that's a two. So we have a total now of four, right? Okay, looking pretty good so far. Um, type of nipple. I wasn't able to assess that nipple, so don't know. And if I'm not able to assess, then I'm not gonna make something up. Okay. Comfort. Um, I did not see the nipple. So I can't tell if it was cracked or bleeding. The breast did not look engorged, but I didn't look it up in the other the other one for comparison, or I hadn't assessed the patient to begin with, so I can't know if this is their norm or not. Um, I don't see any bruises, um, but this is all on the nipple as well and on the breast. Um, and I can't tell if it's soft or non-tender. So because I can't assess, I can't comment. And then positioning. This person was able to get into this position without any assistance. So then that's a two. So this person has a total of six, six out of um, eight, 10, right? Six out of 10. So according to hospital policy, this person probably won't need to be assessed by a lactation consultant. But clearly we have some issues that we ourselves identified, correct? Okay. Do, for the sake of time, do you wanna review this video again now having played the game or uh, would you like to move on? This is for your learning. I've seen it a million times. But if you, if you need to learn from it again, um, we can definitely play it again. I have a question. Who is Hit the me. latch assessment? Is it the nurse? Is it, because this is who's determining if it's lactation consultant. Correct, it is the nurse. It will probably be your postpartum nurse. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I don't need to see it again, but. Okay. Uh, well, how about we do this? If somebody doesn't feel comfortable shouting out saying they want to see it, um, I can stay after and show it again. And of course, this is being recorded. You can definitely con contact Samsara in terms of viewing this recording or having access to it in some fashion as well. Does that sound like a plan for everybody to feel that they don't have to call themselves out should they not feel comfortable? I like showing this video. It's long and I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to, but I can put the, maybe put the link in the chat before we leave today. It's called, I love my baby, but um, 
I don't like breastfeeding. It's riddled with privilege, but it really adds to a lot of discussion points. I put it in the Facebook um, event calendar thing. So if you did get a chance to watch that or see that, it's the same video. Um, but so it adds in- Last week? Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, so if you have access to the Facebook, I posted this and a couple other videos that I'm not gonna, I won't have time to show in this lecture today, but that I love. Uh, this one specifically, and if we had time, I would love to have discussion on it and all the things in this, because it's super loaded in all kinds of silliness, but it's got some good takeaways in terms of how we support our lactating population or our lactating community members and how important language really truly is. Okay, so I, I highly encourage you to watch it. And um, if it makes you feel some kind of way, let me know. And we, you and I can have a, a, a discussion about it. Um, that's the video. Teach me how to breastfeed. This is super awesome. Taught by, uh, done by Tanifer. This is also again in the Facebook page. I'm not gonna play it for you now, I just do out of time, but she's a local IBCLC that runs the Chocolate Milk Cafe in East Oakland. Um, so I've spoken a lot about this, signs of milk transfer. Now, from this point forth, a lot of these um, slides are pretty self-explanatory. So I'm not going to read them to you. You are an adult. You can read and comprehend, and I hate it when people read to me. So I'm just going to try and blow through things. This is a good opportunity to jump in if you have any questions or concerns or even an experience that you would like to share that's relevant. Uh, again, signs of milk transfer, this is really just how we can uh, sub objectify uh, objectively assess how milk is leaving the breast and going into something else. So just like I've explained, the transfer process is where the baby takes the, um, forms um, a trough with its tongue and forms around the teat. In this case, it's defined as a teat and through compression is able to um, get milk out uh, of the breast tissue and into the uh, esophagus down into the stomach. Um, this again happens with a sucking that is a continuous suck, swallow, breathe. Um, and there should be no smacking or clicking or dimpling or puckering at the cheeks. Infant signs of milk transfer will be again, that sustained rhythmic suck swallow pattern. You're gonna hear the swallowing just like we had to assess in the last score. And I'm also gonna see that that baby is satisfied or satiated after feedings. Another definition of this is milk drunk. This right here, this picture is me and my um, firstborn. He's about three days old in this picture and he is absolutely milk drunk. I could have swung him around by his ankles and he would have just been out. Um, he's the person that put the hand in the screen that was, of that was course. something. That was yeah, classic. Something. classic. Yeah, that's, he's 10, so. Um, th those are milks. This is what I'm looking for when a baby is off pops off, I want to see that their hands are nice and open and relaxed. They're not going to be clenched, right? They're going to be really relaxed. This baby is just hanging out, right? I could not put any more in his mouth. Person signs, these are way more subjective. And so I don't necessarily use these as an assessment tool, but they're good to know should I hear somebody say something. Like for example, if someone says that they're experiencing uterine contractions, especially after their second birth, if this is their second or third or subsequent births, I'm definitely gonna see this to be more profound. Anybody wanna take a stab in the dark as to why I would be having uterine contractions and why that plays a role in lactation? Oxytocin. Oxytocin. I was going to also say, Jocelyn can't say anything because she already knows the answer. But yes, oxytocin. That's right. Oxytocin flooding the system because you have milk ejection reflex. But also we have oxytocin receptors in our uterus. And so the more births you have, the more receptors you make, similar to prolactin receptor sites, right? It's the same idea. More receptors you have, the more things react. So with uterine contractions, with more oxytocin receptors, the faster the uterus will, re or the more profound the uterus will respond when oxytocin floods the system. That's why we have uterus contractions. So when people say, oh, I feel like, like my, like I'm cramping again in my mind, I'm thinking, 
Awesome. That's exactly what I want to hear. That's super duper duper cool. That makes me do the happy dance. On the outside, I'm going to talk about pain management. How are you doing? Does pain need to be managed differently? Um, and of course, explain what's happening. Milk leaking from the opposite breast or chest. Absolutely. Because again, we're having milk ejection reflex. It doesn't just happen with one breast. It happens with both. So if you're having a milk ejection reflex, milk is going to go into the infant or whatever you're doing over here. But the opposite breast is also going to leak milk in some fashion. It may shoot out. It may dribble out. It may be just a little bit, but something is going to happen normally. Um, relaxation or drowsiness. We've already kind of talked about this. That's possible. But oxytocin makes you feel all kinds of ways. Uh, breastfeeding or breast softening or feeding. Yeah, I would suggest, especially when you're first figuring this out, feel your breast or chest, how heavy it is. And then after baby gets off, feel how heavy it is. See if there's a difference. And you'll find that there, there should be some difference in the, the weight of which the breast or chest feels. I do not want to see that nipple being pinched or abraded. I'm going to look when that person pulls their nipple out. That's the first thing I'm going to look for is that nipple. What's it look like? Okay, big takeaway. This is what I've been talking about from the, from the jump feeding cues. So early cues are gonna be rooting, stirring, and mouth opening. Rooting is kind of like that when, you, when you're holding a baby and they kind of, I kind of do like a bob. They do like this little apple bob or something like that. That is rooting. That means they're looking for that nipple. They're ready, they're interested, they're ready to rock and roll. Mid cues, especially in the first two weeks, hands to mouth, I'm gonna see increase, like I'm sticking their tongue out like that, that's a great sign. That tells me lots of good things and increased stirring. And then late cues is this other, <clears throat> is this final one. And that's the video that we saw, Dr. Jack Newman's video. That was a late cue. This is also the 10 year old. That was his birth announcement. <laughs> <laughs> um, tongue tie. So as a certified lactation educator and counselor, it is beyond my scope of practice to assess and diagnose for tongue tie, right? And so I kind of push the boundaries by even talking about it with y'all here today. But I think it's important for you to have some visual of what that actually looks like when we're talking about a frenulum and how it impacts the tongue. And so that's the degree to which I'm going to have this conversation with you. I can't diagnose diagnose it um, and I can't treat it. So again, to really recognize uh, where, again, to really emphasize that we all need to stay on our lanes. I'm doing the same, but I do want you to understand what the frenulum is. It is that little string attached to the tongue. And if it's too tight, then you end up seeing this almost um, heart shaped pattern or V pattern in the tongue, in the mouth. Um, and they're unable to get that tongue up and over the gum line, which impacts latch, among other things. Ooh, among other things, it will impact speech, like I said, sleep apnea, a whole variety of other things that tongue tie does. Okay, so again, I can't show this to you because of time, but this is also, I believe, in the Facebook video thing. And also these links are all in your student guide that you can do some additional research on. The Global Health Media Project is the best of the best of the best of the best, 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 any lactation videos. They have videos on latch. They have videos on hand expression. They have videos on... Um, all the things and they're all free. They're free to you. They're free to download. All you have to do. I don't even before you had to sign up as um, like as a community member, like I'm a lactation educator and counselor. And then um, I don't even think I had to give them my email and then I could access these videos. I can download them and they come in all kinds of different languages, which is also amazing. The biggest, 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 most awesome part about this, not only because the content is so perfectly made and narrated, but now we have a variety of different colors and presentations in these videos. There's all kinds of breasts and chests 
in this video all kinds of nipples, all kinds of ways to do things. And also you're not gonna see one bottle in these videos. There's lots of cup and spoon feedings, which is amazing to be able to see. Their hand expression video is gold and so is their latch, which is the one here. Usually I, I have time to show with um, our class, but um, today I don't. Um, I can also put these in the Facebook thing should you have access. And then of course you have my email, email me, email me, contact me, say, I need to see all the videos, all the things. Hand expression. Again, this is another video. This is something you can read on your own. I'm not gonna read it for you, but I am gonna give you a super quick breakdown. <laughs> Hand expression, again, needs to mimic the idea of breast compression. So how we set it up, if I'm gonna teach somebody else to do it, is I usually do two fingers length away from the nipple on the top and the bottom. From here, that's where I'm gonna put my thumb, two fingers, I'm gonna put my pointer finger. Now again, you don't wanna judge by the areola because every everybody's areola is different and diversity is the spice of life, right? You do two fingers width from the nipple. From here, I use my pointer finger and my thumb and I'm going to press straight back into the chest wall, back. I am not going to spread, okay? That's no, I wish I could do like a big X. I'm going to press straight back into the press, straight back into the chest wall. I'm going to press and then release. Back, press, release. Back, press, release, back, press, release. Now, when I first start doing it, nothing will come out and that's normal. But eventually things will start to come out. Another good thing to get going is uh, tingling around the breast, massaging around the breast, just to get everything loosened up and ready to go. And you keep on with that pattern. You can move it. It can be two fingers length this way. So you can do a U or a C, okay? And it doesn't matter, okay? Again, there's a bit of a learning curve, but much like masturbation, the more, more you practice, the more better and efficient you will be at it. Okay, and it's a tool. It's a thing that is absolutely necessary because even if you're pumping, what if you forget a pump thing? What if you don't have clean water? What if you don't have electricity? There's lots of things as to why pumping isn't always um, key. So hand expression is, again, the most efficient uh, way to get milk out as well as um, best for milk composition. Uh, I have another video. That's another global health media project. I highly encourage you to watch it. It's on point. It's seven minutes. It's amazing. So please watch it. Okay, pumps. There are three kinds of pumps, manual, electric, and hospital. Electric pumps are not hospital grade pumps. Hospital grade pumps you get at a hospital. The only thing I'm gonna to talk to you about with pumps is phalange. You want to make sure that nipple is free in that phalange. If it's smushed in there, like this bottom picture, or if it has, um, if it has too much room, then it'll get sucked in and cause pain. We want to make sure that the nipple is free of the flange opening, okay? That's the big takeaway. If they continue to have problems with their pumps, then they need to go see, um, there's uh, uh, people that sell pumps that they are trained in, in those specific mechanics of them and you should go see them. I cannot emphasize this enough. Milk supply is not related to pump output, period. If someone's only able to get four ounces, that's, that does not mean that they only have four ounces of milk, okay? That's a big, huge take away, right? Um, this part here is when I'm talking about how manually expressed milk had higher fat content than in pumps, because again, we do not respond well to, um, stim uh, to suction, but pumps do provide nipple stimulation. They can help with engorgement and they can definitely help for use of milk storage. I am not anti-pump. I just want to make sure people understand how this works. Anybody have any questions? These are the last parts that I just kind of blow through because again, this is stuff that you can, and you have this all in your study guide. So you can refer back to it as well. FYI, 833. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, nipple shields. <clears throat> nipple shields, again, are a tool. 
Uh, they come in these four different types, and I'm sure that there's more out there. Nipple shields are great for a variety of reasons. One, especially if there's extended trauma or bleeding or cracking with that nipple, nipple shields will help. This is also helpful for those with um, with flatter nipples. Some people say that the nipple shield will create that extra bump that is needed for that baby. I kind of don't agree with that, but again, I'm sure that there's lots of lacto lactation consultants that will come here and, and, and disagree with me. So there you go. There you have a, a, a conversation of nipple shields. Nipple shields are helpful in terms of, again, protecting that nipple and also kind of going back to remembering um, people that may have experienced sexual trauma. It's possible for people to kind of keep that trauma within their breast or chest, making um, breastfeeding and chest feeding uh, traumatizing, triggering, um, and challenging to navigate. Nipple shields really help with that uh, in terms of being able to breast or chest feed without feeling triggered um, constantly. Problem is though, just as the name implies, it shields the nipples. Therefore, it reduces nipple stimulation. As a result, it will impact your milk supply. Secondary, nipple or babies get used to the feel of the nipple shield. And so there is a in there is a very long weaning process that must happen if you don't want to use a nipple shield anymore. And it's unpleasant. Uh, anybody have any questions or concerns on that? I had one question. Um, you know how we were, yeah. we were talking about um, <clears throat> about a, a heavy letdown. If someone is using a, a nipple shield and they happen to have, you know, that extra lot, lots of milk coming at one time, can that nipple shield slow down that or will it just flow all over the place and get everywhere? I think it will kind of flow all over the place and get everywhere. It probably will slow it down because it is a barrier between that milk coming okay. out and stuff. And but it's not as, as a side no, but as no. And as a side note to that, though, again, this also sets up to where if you're not cleaning that property properly, then this will also introduce bacteria that puts you at risk for mastitis. So um, you need to clean it thoroughly and, and, and regularly. Um, in addition to, uh, yeah, if you have a forceful letdown, that could be a, a good, that could be a barrier. Um, but again, I also argue that forceful letdowns are just shallow latches. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Uh, it, there's a time and a place for almost everything. And again, we have to bear in mind that hospitals are just given the nipple shields. Lactation, ILBLCs are just given the nipple shields. They, no, they absolutely are. I, I, I did my rotation. That's exactly what the IBCLC did. Uh, um, I, I, uh, 85% or 90% of the people that I, I shadowed her with all got nipple shields, even if they didn't want them. Because the objective for the people in the hospital is to get you to latch. They don't really care what happens after. If that baby's latching and that baby's nursing, done, moving on. They've, they've marked, they've done the latch score. They've marked the box. Baby's on, baby's uh -huh. latching, baby's flying, all done. Bye-bye. Uh, the, the, the after problem is not a them problem. That's a you problem. Okay, how to bottle feed a breastfed baby. Again, you have this, I think almost verbatim in your study guide. I am not going to read this. What this really talks about is paced bottle feeding. And this really is information that as you as a doula can share with your client in terms of how to negotiate milk um, volume, um, at a caregiver. So if, if they're taking their baby to a caregiver and they don't know how to bottle feed a breastfed baby, they could be overfeeding that baby and you using more milk than that person can pump. As a result, that person will say, oh, I'm not making enough milk. My baby's plowing through all this milk. I can't keep up. And that will stop that will create this stress, right? Because now they're back to work and they have to pump and they have to navigate all of that. In addition to now I'm not making enough milk. And it's almost, again, that cascade of events of where people are gonna start slowing their supply. Okay, so that's a big takeaway. Um, people should know if you as a doula, postpartum doula will be bottle feeding breastfed babies. If you know this person is going to be going to a caregiver, they should know how to bottle feed breastfed babies. And, um, 
this is what they do in NICUs as well, is uh, trying to mimic that breastfeeding relationship. So it just really is a breakdown. I'm gonna treat the bottle just like a breast. I'm gonna start the baby touching the bottom of the, of the bottle with the chin. I'm gonna point the nipple at the nose. I'm gonna try to get a good latch. I'm going to bottle feed for about 10 minutes. I'm gonna pull the bottle out. I'm gonna burp and then I'm going to switch sides and I'm going to do the whole thing again. And I'm gonna do it for about 10 minutes, pull the bottle out, burp, switch sides, okay? It also should be very clear how many ounces a baby should take in each given time. Um, this is exactly what you have in your study guide as well. It is just how to store breast milk. It's actually really blown out, that's weird. Anyway, it's you have this exact thing, I'm not gonna read it to you. You also have this, how to thaw milk. Oh, uh, for quicker thawing, it says hold container under running water. Don't do that. That's wasting water. Just pour, use warm water in a, in a pot, put it in the pot, let it kind of uh, warm up, and then use that water to do dishes or whatever. But don't use running water. That's silly. Warm milk, don't use a microwave. They say use bottle warmers now. I was always taught never to use a bottle warmer. Samsara, I don't know. I don't, I, use, I don't use bottle warmers, please don't use I heard that there's, right. yeah, they, they, everybody keeps saying, well, they're different now, they're not the same, and I was like, eh, I think like, I don't know. They boil, the, you, they boil the water, right? And then you put that milk in boiled water and that's no. Yeah, I don't know. It, anyway, this, this, where I got this stuff from is from the, um, the references in your reference guide, so you can look it up, but the, that's what this was. Um, this is talking about shaking milk. People always say, don't ever shake breast milk. Um, you need to swirl it. Um, that's, they say the reason why is because it will, um, it will denature proteins. Um, the only thing that denatures protein is heat and cold. Those are the only things that destroy proteins. Shaking milk does not destroy proteins, just like how when I go for a run or I do Zumba or I go out salsa dancing and I shake my tatas, I am not denaturing proteins in that situation either. So you can absolutely shake breast milk. Nothing will happen. Um, the world will not end and the bottle will not explode. Common concerns. As somebody that's been counseling for around 10 years, I tried to list out some of the things that I hear the most. And the first is I don't have enough milk. And I've kind of peppered that throughout this entire lecture about how that can happen and what that looks like. So some big takeaways, babies should be fed 10 to 12 times every 24 hours or every two hours. Um, and within the first 24 hours, they should not need any supplementation, but it doesn't mean that baby should not be on breast or chest. Every single baby loses weight in the first three to four days. Every single solitary one, formula fed or breastfed, they all lose weight. Um, how we're going to assess whether baby's getting enough is again, satiation, like I was saying before, whether they're satisfied. Another is poops and pees, and it should go along with the day of life they are. So if they're, uh, if their day of life one, I should expect one poop, one pee. Day of life two, two poops, two pees. Day of life three, three poops, three pees. Day of life four, I should have a big change. What happens at day of life four that I would expect to have maybe more poops and more pees, unless I have gestational diabetes? Lacto two. Lacto two. And what happens to me as a person in lacto two? What happens to my milk volume in lacto two? Trying to get another person a chance to answer. I don't, please, yeah, let another person jump in or if somebody has it in the chat, but think about it. What happens? Progesterone drops and your milk changes and the. My milk, milk does what? My increases, increases. in volume. Yeah. increases in volume. That's right. So if I have way more milk, that means every time that baby goes to the bar, they're getting way more milk than what they were getting before. As a result, I should have way more poops and peas at my day of life four. And by day of life five, I should stop losing weight and I should be starting to gain weight. 
that's what we're looking for. By day of life five, I should stop seeing that weight dropping. I should see it either stay still or I should see an increase, okay? That's what I'm looking for. Goal is to establish milk supply, okay? We need to reinforce that person is making enough milk unless we can otherwise see. Um, we, I already spoke about this. If person ex receives excess fluids, this is fluid overload, remember? Um, and also this fluid shift could happen with the infant, which means that instead of a 7% loss of body weight birth, uh, from birth weight, I can lose more because that's fluid. Okay, so if, if I get a phone call from somebody saying, um, people are worried about my milk supply because baby has lost 8% of their weight and we're at day of life three, then I'll say, okay, uh, I know hospitals won't even do anything until about 11%. So 8% doesn't make me want to throw myself into traffic. So uh, the next question I'm going to ask is what happened at birth? And at that point, I wouldn't be surprised if I said person has received a section or person was on epidural and every time you have an epidural, you have fluid on board. Okay. Uh, and about the fluid, like, how do you know there's too much or what is too much? And it just feels like, um, the hospitals never talk about that. And yeah, <laughs> obviously <laughs> we our role as well, but um, it's just interesting because <laughs> they, yeah. they feel like they use fluid for every little thing that happens. They're like, oh, we need to put more fluid. That's a great question. And we have to remember that fluid in terms of, it, it, well, fluid really is, a, 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 it's a safe, right? It's a, this is how we're going to make sure that you're not going to bottom out, that your blood pressure isn't going to plummet and that you're not going to stroke out. Uh, we need to make sure you have enough fluid on board so that your blood pressure doesn't increase, right? And we obviously don't want it to increase too much, right? Because then that'll be that we want everybody to stay relatively within their uh, per normal parameters. And that's why there's fluid. And that's why we can't say, um, every individual needs at least one liter of, of fluid because I may need less fluid. Otherwise, it'll make my blood pressure increase. You may need more fluid because your blood pressure is decreasing. Does that make sense? So there's no specific amount. And that's why it seems like this arbitrary number or weird space where we can't really put a number. Um, with that said, though, signs of which you've had too much fluid, again, will also go to the physical signs, the edema, the swollen hands, swollen feet, and swollen areolas and swollen breast tissue or chest tissue is really where you're going to see um, edema or fluid overload where it's impactful. Um, and you're going to see that shift in the infant. And again, that's going to be a different shift. What's that going to look like? Everybody's different. It, I, I don't have a specific um, amount that's going to be like this person received one liter of fluid and now 12% of that fluid is going to shift to the infant. So I expect an increase of 1% body loss due to fluid. It's, 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 it's too challenging, and too specific to say. Um, but so, I know that if I'm saying, in this, no, I was going to say, so, go ahead. Um, in a situation where someone had a bunch of fluid and it's taking longer for their milk supply to um, become more abundant, what would you suggest they do while they wait? Sweat it out. Sweat okay. it out. Turn the heater on, put on a jacket. You're going to notice that their body already has the inapt way to do that anyway. That's how we deal with fluid shifts. Uh, you know, that's why some people, when they're about to start, maybe start their cycle, they're a little bit more sweaty than usual. They pee a little bit more than usual, even though their water take hasn't shifted. It's just their body being like, all right, dog, you got, we got way too much fluid on board, everybody out. And so we're going to start to sweat in weird places that we wouldn't have sweat and we would pee more than we pee. And so I would tell that person, get up, pee regularly and um, put on a jacket and try and sweat it out. Thank you. You're very welcome.
Okay, so engorgement, again, language is extremely important. I know I think I have about 10 more minutes left, so I hope y'all are doing okay. Um, engorgement is when I have a milk transfer issue. If somebody calls me and says, Laura, I'm engorged, that tells me milk is not leaving my breast or chest, and I am now in pain and at danger of, of an infection because milk is now stagnant. Fullness is what we see from transition from lacto one to lacto two. This is why it's important to talk about this because it can be profound and um, surprising. And so it's important to recognize like your milk is going to increase in volume. And so your breast or chest will change shape. Um, this is what somebody looks like pre-pregnancy and then Day three of postpartum, they've transitioned to lactogenesis two. Obviously their milk has increased in volume and so their breast size has changed. That's pretty profound. That's a pretty good jump. And so you should let people know about that. This is not engorgement. This is fullness and it's expected. This is what I want to see. I want to see something like this. Sore nipples. Sore nipples, we've talked a lot about sore nipples. So I don't really feel like I need to go over any more than what we've talked about right now. Um, things that can cause it, latch and position um, and thrush, which I'll talk about in a minute, how we treat it, assess last and position and get help if you think you need it. Oh man, I don't think this one has it. Gosh darn it. It doesn't. Okay, so I apologize. I didn't include the slide for thrush, so I'm going to talk about it very briefly, really quickly, because it is it is an important thing to understand. Thrush is really just a yeast infection. It's the same yeast that you find in your vagina or in your anus. Um, it's a natural part of our system, a part of our um, ecosystem that we have in our body. But once we take in any kind of antibiotics or we we knock out that equilibrium, then um, we have an overrun of something else. It's the same concept that happens here. Um, it usually happens when I when I see it most is when I know that somebody has received antibiotics, most likely during labor or after birth. Most specifically, those pretty powerful IV antibiotics, but you can also have antibiotics um, not IV by mouth, and they'll still make the same situation where yeast will overrun. Um, really, you see it in baby's mouth, and it appears as white patches on their tongue that you can't wipe off. It doesn't feel good. It's itchy. Baby will be more fussy and crying and won't really want to latch. Uh, on the other end of that, you can get a yeast infection on your nipples because that baby had a yeast infection in its mouth or because you had antibiotics and now everything's kind of out of whack. Um, this presents as really red nipples. It's extremely painful and it's a painful latch and it's deep pain shooting from the nipple going all the way up the breast for the entire duration of the feeding session. It is awful. You need to go get treated with an antifungal. Uh, it can be via prescription but you need to make sure that the dyad is being treated. A lot of the times they'll just treat one of them. They'll treat the person with the nipples or they'll treat the baby. You need to treat them both because the two of them interact, right? Um, when they don't treat them both, what I do is I recommend that the person with the nipples soak their nipples after every feeding in half water, half vinegar to kill the yeast. I also recommend that they walk around and topless in the day because remember yeast is much like bacteria it loves dark warm sugary places and your nipples are perfect for that so walking around topless um, is great it's a win-win for everybody everybody loves a topless person uh, and so that will help with getting rid of the yeast you also need to wash everything that touches the nipples and everything that touches that baby's mouth pacifiers bottles um, bras sheets uh, shirts, any towels, anything and everything needs to be washed in hot water to kill the yeast. Okay, that's thrush. Jaundice. So I've already kind of spoken about this. We have a couple more minutes. And so this is another big thing to talk about. Um, again, Really what jaundice is, is the baby's liver can't clear out those dead red blood cells and can lead to kernicterus. Um, 
here, this again is in your study guide, so you can refer to this a lot. But there are four different types of jaundice, breast milk jaundice, and um, no breastfeeding or, eight or starvation jaundice. This is why starvation jaundice is the one where they want to supplement, right? That this is where they're feeling baby is losing too much weight, they're not getting enough peristalsis, they're not getting enough colostrum. And so we need to correct whatever's happening with that baby. And we also need to supplement because something has to get into that baby. But breast milk jaundice is jaundice that continues even if breastfeeding is going well. This is the type of jaundice that people refer to. This is the type of jaundice that the research is referring to that there's varying degrees of bilirubin levels and antiviral properties, more specifically in, speci in different types of people. Um, people that have darker skin tones also have these properties of having this antiviral antiviral properties. I can't think of an, another way to say it, um, but they're less likely to get sick. And if they do get sick, the duration is shorter in comparison to others. Uh, my boy had jaundice. Uh, he was a 36 weeker. And when he gets sick, he's sick for two days. The rest of us, including my daughter, who was born on time, didn't have jaundice, are sick for two weeks. Uh, again, this is a good thing to refer to, good to do your homework. I'm not gonna read it to you because y'all can do it yourself. I've also spoken about mastitis, um, talked about what the symptoms could be, pain, swelling, you're gonna have a fever, you're gonna feel like you got run over by a Mack truck. It can be caused by a blocked milk duct or it can be caused by bacteria entering your breast or chest. You need to go on antibiotics. And I always tell people they need to be seen by a provider. Some people say, no, call the advice nurse. I hate that because there are varying degrees of mastitis and you can die from this. This can cause sepsis. You have blood veins going through your breast and chest that if bacteria gets in your bloodstream, it's over, okay? It's very, very serious. People have died from mastitis. I don't re recommend any over-the-counter stuff that you can take. I don't recommend any teas or tinctures. Go to the hospital and get antibiotics. So it can also show inf inflammation and skin redness on top of the breast or chest. So factors influencing breastfeeding, family influence and support, hospital uh, health care providers, access to information uh, to support, including prenatal and postpartum periods, and return paid family leave, like California paid family leave and the labor code. The World Health Organization is really designed to help protect and promote breastfeeding. And so they've created the WHO code. The WHO code was established in 1981. And really it is how we advertise and talk about artificial baby milk and how we have access to it. We are one of the only countries in the world that do not adhere to the WHO code. Everybody else does. That means you can't get formula without a prescription. That means you don't see formula advertisements on television. That means you don't get formula samples from your hospital or delivered to your home. Yeah. So um, the only nod that we do to the WHO code, we being America, is on those advertisements, you hear them say, breast is best, but when uh -huh. breastfeeding doesn't work, try Similac or whatever else it is. That is our nod to the WHO code, okay? The WHO code, again, you have access to this. You can read it, it's pretty cool. So in the Bay Area, we have a, a variety of baby-friendly hospitals and how baby-friendly hospitals uh, go with uh, breastfeeding is this. They need to comply to these 10 steps in order for them to be considered baby-friendly. This, again, is something that you can read. I will not read it to you. Does it work? 
we do see increase in rates of initiation and sustain in breastfeeding, but we also do see um, discrepancies, right? We see certain populations where breastfeeding rates are lower than anybody else's. So although baby friendly hospitals do work, there is still a lot more work to be done. Contraindications to breastfeeding, untreated TB. We're now getting to understand that not only untreated TB, but treated, uh, TB meds you can um, take while breast or chest feeding. Um, it really is dependent on the hospital and country that you live in. Definitely can't do it with varicella. Active herpes lesions on the breast. If I have an active herpes lesion in my armpit, you can still breastfeed or chest feed. If I have a herp herpes lesion on the nipple or around my areola, probably not. Okay. HIV infection in the United States for the longest time, you are not allowed to breast or chest feed while you're HIV positive. But because of a lot of information and research specifically coming out of HIV dominant countries such as South Africa, mm -hmm. what they have found is that the rate of transmission drops significantly if the person's viral load is low and they are compliant on their uh, antiretrovirals. That drops that transmission rate so low that the benefits for breastfeeding and the benefits for mature milk far outweigh the risk of transmission. So now, hospital policies here in California are starting to rethink about how they're going to support our HIV community members in lactation. Um, it's not perfect, but it's definitely a step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Of course, you don't want to breast or chest feed while on street drugs. You can't do it when you're uh, alcohol abuse. Um, you can't do it if you're being treated for breast cancer or on in immunosuppressive meds. And again, I've already spoken about galactosemia. This is when somebody's allergic to galactose and um, they need a very specific type of formula that has no galactose and they will never ever be able to have galactose. Okay, so. I have questions, it's a final test. It's nine o'clock on a Tuesday and it's gonna be hard. These are hard questions. Do you guys want to do them? Do you wanna live on the edge and plow through the questions? I see some fingers, I see a thumbs up. That's good enough for me. Everybody else, blame them, okay? So you can, <laughs> you have an option. You can either yell on the, on, in, your, in your thing or you can do it on chat or you can, I can only see, let's see, one, I only have three squares of people on my screen. You can give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down, okay? Here are the questions, they're hella hard. Is pumping a good way to tell how much milk I have? No. No. No! Oh. Is, no. Is, bre <laughs> is breastfeeding hard? Does it tie a mom down? Is formula feeding easier? No. 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 It's all hard. It's all hard. Let me just break that down for you really, really quickly. It's all hard. It's having kids is hard. Um, breastfeeding or, or formula feeding is, is just as hard. Are modern formulas the same as breast milk? No. 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 If a baby or a person are sick, should they stop breastfeeding? No. 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 <laughs> <laughs> if if a person is taking a medication, should they stop breastfeeding? Depending on the medication. Depending on the medication. On the medication. Yeah. Whoop, whoop. Okay, I'm gonna put in the chat. Here we go. It's called LactMed, and it's funded by Toxnet. There's a free app for both your Apple and Android devices. All you have to do is type in the med. It can be over the counter. It can be a prescription, and it'll break down if you can take it while lactating and at what age would it be appropriate? So maybe not appropriate for a two month old, but a six month old, it will be okay. Lactmed is both an app. And again, you can look it up on your, uh, on your web browser. Easy peasy, taco peasy, one of the best apps I have on my phone and it makes me look hella smart. Okay, does breastfeeding toddlers spoil them? No. Is it illegal to breastfeed in a restaurant? No. 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 In the, right? It, right? In the state of California, the only place that it's illegal to breastfeed is in someone's house. So if I go to Sam Sara's house and, and I start to breastfeed and she's like, dude, you can't do that here. By law, I cannot breastfeed in her house. Is that going to stop me from breastfeeding on the sidewalk in front of the window in her house? No. <laughs> And am I supported by law to do, 
If I'm supported by law to do that, yes, I am. It's okay. supported by California Constitution, so that that's right. That's right. Should you stop breast or chest feeding when you're pregnant? No. 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 Should that's right. Don't do infants need to learn how to take a bottle? No. 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 Does breast augmentation or reduction mean I can't breastfeed? Depends. Above the muscle, below Depends. the muscle. Maybe. How old is too old to breast or chest feed? It's up to the family. Personal choice. That's right. So proud of you guys. Okay. Can I breast or chest feed while I'm on antidepressants? Yes. 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 If I can take it prenatally, I can take it during lactation, but you need oh. to do your research on it. Okay. Can do people need to avoid certain foods while smoke? Well, uh, do people need to avoid certain foods while breastfeeding? Yes. Yes. Like what? Uh, cruciferous vegetables, uh, things that have gas, that make baby gassy, maybe spicy. Sure. Stuff. No spice. No, you can eat sushi. You can eat all the things. Don't take away sushi. You can't have it when you're pregnant. Don't take away sushi. That's not nice. That's not nice. Yeah, you can eat all the things. The only thing, just like what that person said, um, you can't, uh, if, if, if something makes you gassy, it'll make them gassy. So if you get gassy from broccoli, they'll probably get gassy from broccoli. If you're allergic to something, they'll probably be allergic to it. So if you're allergic to peanut butter, don't eat peanut butter and breastfeed. Uh, what are the risks of smoking marijuana? Oh, I like it. Silence. Uh, we don't know yeah. we don't know what they are we don't know so if I know that somebody smokes marijuana I don't know I can't tell them not to do it I can't tell them to do it there's some research but it's definitely not it's not enough for me to tell them to not do something so that's I don't know very, that's very interesting I have a kind of standard feeling around not smoking around baby so you shouldn't but it's not nicotine right it's not cigarettes so they're totally different, right? I don't, I'm not, I'm not making them uh, smell like, um, you know, all the chemicals and, and stuff that cancer causes in the carcinogenics and that are in cigarettes. It's not the same in marijuana. Now I'm not supporting it. I'm not saying they should, but I don't have if, enough if evidence to tell them not to. they organic soil in their backyard, if they got it from I don't know. on the street, you know. I don't know, I don't know. Okay, can breast or chest feeding be a cultural barrier? Yes. yes, it can. Yes, it can. Yes, it can. Absolutely. And I wish we had another class to talk about how that makes such a big impact. Um, can you take birth, can birth control stop milk production? Yes, because of progesterone. Remember, progesterone is the man. Always keep you down. Does cabbage works re, work to reduce pain and engorgement? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you have a swollen ankle, put some cabbage leaves on there and that will reduce the swelling, absolutely. If you do it too much, it'll pull out too much fluid, so be aware, but absolutely works. What about homeopathic remedies to increase milk supply? Do I need to take a homeopathic remedy to increase my milk supply? No. No, oh, I didn't mention one homeopathic remedy in this whole mess because you all are all set up for success. Now, does that mean that cookies aren't gonna make you feel good and you should eat cookies? You should eat cookies, like even if they're lactation cookies I make like my husband and I still eat lactation cookies and nobody's lactating it's good stuff <laughs> does extended breastfeeding lead to separation anxiety no no does breast milk help with common ailments like pink eye or rash or eczema yes yes, yes. can breastfeeding help with postpartum weight loss yes yeah. yes can vegans breastfeed without supplementation yes Yes. yes, they just need to make sure that they're taking their vitamin B12. And most vegans are. Vitamin B12 is mostly profound in, in animal meat, um, but they there are lots of ways to supplement that. And vegans are usually really good at making sure that they take it. Is breastfeeding a natural contraceptive? Not in this country. No. Not in Please, 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 no, please, no. Okay, y'all. Here, notice on the top is the LACMED. This again, you have all of this in your in your student guide. Kelly Mom, Dr. Jack Newman, where I got the resources. Stanford, UC Davis have amazing resources for um, lactation. I highly recommend it. SF Breastfeeding Promotion. Prom 
Promotion Coalition here in the Bay Area, California Breastfeeding Coalition being run by some bad ass people. Check it out. Global Media Project right there on the bottom. That's where you get all those wonderful videos that you will be looking at, right? Latch and Hand Expression. These are the books that I use. Beware of In a May Guide. She has a really hard time acknowledging where she got that information from, including our Black, African American, Indigenous population. And Counseling the Nursing Mother, that is the textbook that I use. I highly recommend it, but it's also really, really pricey. Lots of great info in there. Support groups, really great opportunity for your clients should they need additional support outside the hospital. For our LGBTQ AI community, please be aware of using La Leche League. They had a really hard time being inclusive to their trans community members. They have now switched their stance, but I also do extra diligent homework if I ever refer someone to a La Leche League leader or a La Leche League group, especially if they are within that LGBTQAI community, just to make sure that they absolutely get the non-biased 1000% care and support that they need in order to navigate lactation and chest feeding. These are all my references. You have all of them. I highly suggest you go down all the rabbit holes this provides. Here is resources and further information on chest feeding and lactation indu induction methods. This is from Dina Malready. She's a certified nurse midwife over at the General in San Francisco, also a professor at um, UCSF where I go to school. I've been her TA for quite some time. This is all about how to support our trans community members in lactation, as well as information about um, uh, estrogen and testosterone while lactating. Really great resources. Um, again, and that's it. Y'all, you did it. Y'all are so awesome. But Thank you made all of it happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Thank you. So, okay. Go ahead. Would you want no, I was going to say, you have my emails. I'm always available. Contact me, call me, text me, email me. Tell me how awesome you are. If you need any of my help or assistance, I'm 100% here for you. We're in this together. You guys are awesome. Nine o'clock on a Tuesday. That's amazing. And so uh, Laura's also in the student portal. So if you have questions, you could tag her in the, in the group and she will see that eventually and respond to you. She's pretty good at that stuff. When I tag her, she responds in a prompt manner. Um, I'm very happy to see everybody here, and it looks like almost everybody is here till the bitter end. That's fabulous. Wow, that's impressive. <laughs> it really is. So I want to just speak to the people who are going to watch this video uh, that aren't here tonight, because this is going to be posted in our our uh, on our YouTube channel, Better Birth TV on YouTube. Check us out. Whoop. And whoop, whoop. Um, I know it's too much happiness. So uh, everything that was said here is the words and experience of our amazing presenter. She's not a doctor, which is why she was invited. Oh, no, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> That's what I did. But, um, uh, silly me. So uh, bear that in mind. Uh, please, definitely, if you're a breastfeeding parent and you're watching this video, consult with an ILPLC. I hope I said that right. Did I say all the did I say all the alphabets? A lactation specialist or lactation consultant. Um, that person might have better uh, information for you for you than an MD because unless they've been taught by Laura or somebody else amazing like her, a lot of docs don't get this information. So uh, if you're struggling, definitely uh, contact a, a lactation consultant. Uh, Hopefully your doula has some good information to share with you. You can always contact us at Oakland Better Birth Foundation, Oakland Better Birth Foundation at gmail.com and ask your questions there, wherever you are in the wide world. We'll try to help you find someone who can give you a hand. Um, I'm all biased, so I'm speaking from this place of all bias that um, I have absolute confidence that the vast majority of folks who decide to breastfeed can do this. And it's a matter of getting the proper support and um, faith in yourself, maintaining your good health, eating good, 100 grams of protein still, 
lots of agua, lots of kisses from your friends and family members and partners or your other kids, because that makes the oxytocin and makes the milk flow. Um, don't give up, get the help. And most of the problems with breastfeeding are, are overcomable. Nope, so hang in there. So I wanna thank you for uh, all you guys who are here right now. I wanna thank you folks in the future who might watch this video. I wish you peace and baby blessings. And that's all folks. Thank you, Laura. Good night, y'all. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, thank Laura. Good night, everyone. Hey, Sam, Sarah. It's a pleasure and an honor, like always. Yes, it is. I love your beautiful face. I, I love, love your beautiful all face. Your... <laughs> and I love all the good information. And thank you for helping me have like the all most the perfect doulas in the world, you know? All the time. Anytime you call me and you let me know, uh, just let me know the dates. You know, I'll always be there. Yep. Love Every time. Ya. Love ya. Love ya. Love you take good care out there. It's going to be rainy and slick. Stay love, home. Look, I am staying home. And Good. kiss those beautiful children of yours. I will. When they, when they I will. wake up. When they wake I know. Up. Absolutely. No. Yeah. Keep absolutely. Children, and let them lie. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Bye. Good night. Bye.